So good afternoon, dear colleagues. It is uh, three o'clock Vienna time, and we will now start our webinar on shallow geothermal energy research in a global context in the framework of the cost action geothermal DHC. Uh, my name is uh, Gregor Götzl. I'm working on the geological survey of Austria, and I'm currently also chairing the cost action geothermal DHC. It's a, a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, we will focus on shallow geothermal energy, but not just for Europe, but we also look at both Europe. And um, it's great to have you here. Just a few rules uh, for, for this webinar. Uh, please uh, switch off your microphones, uh, mute yourself when, when you're not speaking. Uh, the same please also apply to your cameras. And um, I kindly ask the presenters. So uh, there is some background noise, just one second. I also kindly ask the presenters to switch on the cameras when they give the presentation. Unfortunately, my camera collapsed today morning, so you cannot uh, see myself. So that's why I put a picture on the first uh, slide on this main uh, presentation for today. Uh, concerning question, questions, so please use the chat function of WebEx for posting your, your questions. I also invite the presenters to comment or reply to questions also uh, in the chat window, but my colleague Vasiliki, uh, she, she will collect all the questions uh, during the presentations and after each presentation we will uh, have a, a short uh, question and answer round and uh, she will um, put the questions to the speakers. Uh, please also note that this meeting will be recorded. It, it is uh, streamed via, via YouTube. We have a own YouTube channel for this cost action. And um, yeah, so just a quick overview about the program of today. So we have seven invited speakers from around the world today on different aspects of shallow geothermal energy use. So we look at uh, uh, this technology from different angles. So we look at governance at, of introducing the shallow geothermal into a new market. We look at uh, technologies, especially uh, on future options, um, how to use shallow geothermal energy. Uh, and um, yeah, I will start with a short introduction I will only give you a, f a few few words about what is geothermal DHC for those who, who are not familiar with it. And I prepared uh, a few slides on the global uh, shallow geothermal market. Uh, also, of course, having a look on Europe uh, in more detail and just give you some yeah, inputs for, the, for the, the key driving factors from my point of view which might be relevant for, for future research. After me, my colleague uh, Felix Antoine Comot from Canada will talk about uh, shallow tube from energy use in a cold climate environment in Canada, in Quebec. We will then switch from the no North America to South America. And uh, Carlos Mauricio Luna Filisolo uh, will speak about introducing shallow geothermal into a new market in Colombia. Very interesting because they have a different um, kind of applications and in the Northern hem Hemisphere, it's, I expect more focusing on cooling. We'll then switch from Colombia to Can Canary Islands and uh, Alejandro Garcia Gil from Spain will talk about using shallow tube from energy in, in an island, which is also very important because um, many, most European islands still depend on the import of fossil fuels for uh, electricity or electricity and heat production and uh, shallow geothermal can play a role there. Then we have a coffee break around 4.30. We go back to Europe, continental Europe, starting in Portugal. So João Figueira will speak about uh, sustainability of shallow geothermal energy use, uh, linked to his PhD work and about governance. And, and finally, at the final three presentations today, we will go more into technical details. So we will start looking at uh, constructive elements, the coupling with foundations. Uh, so Marco Bala will, from the Technical University of uh, Torino, will speak about coupling with metro tunnels. 
we will go afterwards to Denmark, looking at uh, fifth generation district heating and cooling microgrids in Denmark. So it will be presented by Søren Poulsen from the university. And finally, we also look at uh, the role of um, energy storage, heat and cold storage in, in aquifer systems. And uh, Stein Bernick from um, Netherlands, we speak about monitoring of aquifer thermal energy storage in the Netherlands. And that's the program of today. So I will now start with my short introduction, a short, some, a few comments. So first about geothermal DHC. So the, the, it's a cost action which started la, uh, last year in 2019 or already more than one year ago uh, in autumn 2019. For those who are not familiar with cost, cost is, is a, a, a corporation on research cooperation and um, capitalization from the European Union. It's funded by the framework program, but its cost actions are not projects. There are more networks where new ideas can be grown and uh, networks can be established. And uh, Geothermal DHC is a network focusing on the integration of geothermal energy into district heating and cooling systems. In the moment, we have around 140 participants from around 39 countries of course uh, most mostly in europe because it's a european initiative but not exclusively so we already have a few partners outside of europe it's an open research network so there is no obligation participating in a cost action it's based on voluntary contribution that means there was no staff cost supply in return by cost the network is chaired by myself and my colleague Dejan Milenic from Belgrade. Um, and if you would like to learn more about the structure and how to access our network, you, you see um, the, present, uh, the web address of our action. So our main, main idea is to, to match geothermal energy sources with different generation of district heating and cooling grids. And we have a, 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 a huge portfolio which we could apply starting at very low temperatures of uh, below 10 degrees Celsius for the latest generation of district heating systems, going up to temperatures such as uh, 150 degrees and more. When you look at very old uh, district heating uh, uh, grids, of course, these high temperature resources are currently lim limited to just a few spots around Europe. Uh, so we'd be following an, an open technological approach in geothermal DHC, so we don't exclude any technology. We look at different technologies and we, we instead focus on this integration aspect. And when it comes to integration, geothermal energy can take a twofold role in the district heating system. It can be a source, especially for, for base load, because we are, it's affected with low operational costs, but moreover, geothermal energy can be storage. So that's why underground thermal energy storage, UTS, has the same relevance as pure geothermal energy use as a source in our system. Uh, why are we doing this? Because uh, um, we believe that uh, if you look at the decarbonization of the heating and cooling market in Europe and in the global context, we are all facing similar problems, that the future solu solutions to get uh, uh, away from uh, to get to get rid of uh, fossil fuels, it will mainly base on two concepts. One is heat pumps for individual use, and the other one is district heating at different temperature levels. And as the heat roadmap Europe showed, that showed uh, it is possible to decarbonize uh, without any new technology, which which is not invented yet, uh, to de decarbonize the heating and cooling sector and. From a geothermal point of view, it's interesting because geothermal can address both aspects, individual heating based on heat pumps, especially uh, for uh, based on shallow geothermal, but also district heating and district heating at uh, also at low temperature levels. And the idea is that we define some kind of an ambition, some kind of uh, targets for the future. And it was simply to to remember 30% in 2030 and 50% in 2050. But what does it stand for? The 30% is first that the share of district heating and cooling, it needs to be 
waste on the European um, heating and cooling market. Uh, currently, we are around 10 to 12 percent. The goal is to show ways that district heating and cooling can have a share of at least 30 percent in 2030, in the next in, in ten, uh, nine years from now. Of course, it would be great to, to say, yeah, uh, these district heating systems and cooling systems would also mainly rely on, sh on shallow geothermal energy, on, on, sorry, on geothermal energy. So at least I would say it would be great to also announce 30% share of geothermal energy for district heating systems. But I think this is not realistic in the moment. We are currently below 1% uh, of geothermal energy inside district heating and cooling systems of the, those market numbers which are available to us. But it would be great to go at, to at least 10% or more, in the optimum case, 30% uh, until 2030 of geothermal energy supply. But on the long term, I believe that geothermal will play a role, especially after the period of 2030, because we have long preparation periods. So the goals for 2050 would be 50% share of DHC inside the heating and cooling sector, and inside DHC, 50% share of geothermal. That would be our the ambition of this cost action. So if you look at the shallow geothermal in a global context, we uh, we still can see that uh, the the heat the geothermal heating market it it uh, significantly grew in the last five years and mainly due to geothermal heat pumps. If you look at the global statistics from the World Geothermal Conference uh, published last year by Land and Todd, uh, you can see here on the, on the left hand side the growth from uh, different periods from 1995 to 2020, and on the left hand side you see the uh, ground source heat pumps growth. Uh, so shallow geothermal has a share of about 72% of all geothermal capacities and around 60% of the energy production for heating in the global context. But we ha it's, it's quite unbalanced. So the top five countries, which you see on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, they cover around 78% of all uh, uh, heat production based on shallow geothermal. So it's, it's not well distributed. And on the global context, we could observe uh, uh, growth rates around 10% per year between 2014 and 2019, which looks quite well on the, on the first look. And if you look at the UP market, you see these are the numbers from the EJAC geothermal market report. On the X axis, you see the diffusion, that means number of installed units per 1,000 households. On the logarithmic scale, on, on the y-axis, you see the growth rate uh, from the market numbers, compare, comparison between 2018 and 2019. And you see that there is a clear uh, diffusion curve uh, visible. And uh, the dotted line in, in, uh, indicates the average of all countries listed in the EJAC market report. And you can also see uh, this development paths from emerging markets having a low diffusion rate uh, when it comes to uh, installed units per households, but high uh, annual growth rates. And you, then you come, of course, naturally to high diffusion rate and low, low um, growth rates because the market are always start to get saturated. But it's a uh, it needs to be it's it's uh, needs to be pointed out that countries like Sweden they already have a, a, a according to the market numbers a diffusion rate of more than ten percent. So it means each, more than each tenth household uses a, a geothermal heat pump, and you, and you see also on this sketch several clusters with similar conditions uh, regarding to, to diffusion, and uh, of course how. Shallow geothermal develops is strongly depending on the boundary conditions. So what is the price for competitive uh, and, uh, heating sources like for fossil fuels? How is, how is uh, taxation on energy, on electricity? And it can lead to supportive or to less supportive um, um, conditions. And uh, it's a very dynamic process. And it's often very much also depending on stop and go policies. That means uh, for a couple of a period of time, uh, policymakers support the, uh, with incentives the installation of uh, shallow tube financial use, and then they, they reduce this support. Or and and uh, yeah, pe people switch, of course, to to the uh, 
best known and, and uh, um, lowest investment cost related technology source. And uh, so that's why also awareness plays a big role how the, the geothermal energy market develops. If you compare it with uh, aerothermal systems, and there is a strong competition, as most of you uh, may know. And if you look on the right hand side of this sketch, you see the market numbers, the annual sales from the European Heat Pump Association, EHPA. And what you can observe between 2015 and 2019, the overall, uh, overall heat pump market was growing at around 10% per year. But in, and it's getting stronger and stronger because now the technology really enters in, in, on a large scale into the heating market in Europe. But uh, this mostly or exclusively applies to uh, air-based systems. And if you look at the, at the white dotted line on the bottom of this um, sketch, this is uh, the development for ground source heat pumps. And you see that it's still stagnant. It's not, comp it's not participating at this overall trend. But if you look at the numbers, in a more specific way, these are only showing uh, sold units in terms of pieces. But if you look at the different capacity ranges, uh, and we have good numbers from Austria, there's a very detailed statistic available. What you can see is that if you look at the large scale systems, so uh, starting uh, at uh, 40 kilowatts, 50 kilowatts plus, then you see there's still the domination of ground source heat pumps because they're efficiency, low level of uh, uh, emissions comes into place, but on the, on the, on the small scale units, there is, a, a, let's say, hard to comp compete in the moment with um, aerothermal systems. So that's brought me to a conclusion, so some uh, thoughts about how, what are, how to understand the driving factors uh, of the geology from the market and what can we learn for, for research, what can we learn with regard to future assets? And I uh, identified for myself three main aspects. The first, of course, upfront costs, the investment. It's uh, very important because uh, uh, Geofirma is, is still, in the, for the, for the, uh, when it comes to the upfront costs, more expensive than other. Less efficient renewables, we have governance and we have new applications. All of these, uh, these three aspects, they, of course, interact with each other. And I just pointed out some of the issues, some of the arguments which should be considered uh, for, for being more competitive in the future. Some of them, they come from research itself. So like uh, cheap solutions for single family homes where there is a strong competition with aerothermal systems. Finding synergies with constructive elements, there is, uh, with, with um, foundations and so on to lower this upfront costs. This is, these are technological developments, but we also come to upscaling to large scale installations when we can benefit from economic upscalings of costs. And of course, uh, if you look at non-technological boundary conditions, right business solutions are, are, are crucial. So it means that you decouple the investment and the use financially. Uh, and of course, then it's very much depending on policies. Uh, we don't know how regulations will look like in the future when it comes to waste, heat, noise from aerothermal systems. There will be more stricter uh, re um, regulations than it will be in a, 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 a push towards um, ground source heat pumps. Uh, and of course, the new applications uh, very much depending also on the upscaling aspect. That means uh, we have this low temperature district heating cooling networks and the use of the shallow subsurface shifts from pure heat extraction or heat dumping to the combined uh, cooling, heating and storage. I think my point of view, these are very in important aspects and, and uh, I'm very glad that some of these are addressed in the, in the follow-up presentations. Uh, with that said, I would to close my, my short introduction, and I'm, I'm very happy to announce now the first speaker of today, uh, Felix Antoine. Um, he will speak about uh, shallow geothermal energy research in Quebec, in Canada. And uh, the floor is yours, Felix, and I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. 
Um, I'm pleased to uh, present you a review of uh, the research we're doing at the High uh, NRS Quebec Canada on Charlotte Geothermal uh, Energy. Uh, uh, INRS is a university um, uh, exclusively for with uh, graduate, graduated uh, students, um, uh, then a master, uh, PhD, and postdoctoral fellow. Um, um, excuse me, Felix, yeah. your microphone is still at quite low. Could you try to, to improve the volume? Is it better now? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Then just a bit of uh, context. Uh, Canada is a very big, uh, big country, as you uh, as you know, uh, compared to Europe. Uh, then uh, the Quebec province is the French part of Canada here. Uh, uh, almost three three times bigger than France, but uh, the the population is uh, uh, quietly uh, lower. Uh, then the, um, we we have uh, eight million uh, people in in, in Quebec. Uh, then is the um, then it's 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 quite a different for uh, at this context. Um, in Quebec, we are lucky because uh, most of our uh, electricity comes from uh, hydropower, uh, from hydroelectric dam. And um, but uh, in the future, we want to try to um, diversify our uh, energy portfolio, and uh, it's why we are uh, trying to uh, do research in the uh, energy. Uh, short term system in Quebec are still uh, marginal, but uh, mostly we are uh, using um, uh, a closed loop uh, system. And um, then uh, in the in the figure on, on the right, um, we see that the, the hydroelectric dams uh, are at, at the center of the of the province. Then uh, the the half the, the, the north of the province is not. Uh, at all the connected to the um, electric grid and uh, all the small uh, villages uh, as a, a thermal plant and the furnaces for uh, electricity and eating then uh, we are uh, working um, uh, there to find a solution to um, to be less dependent uh, to uh, have fossil fuels but also we are working in, in, in the south where the population is uh, uh, higher to uh, to use also the geothermal energy. Uh, you know, in Quebec is uh, is uh, it could be colder than uh, in Europe. Um, we uh, we the the uh, general mean and get temperature uh, can reach. Um, Almost minus ten in the north, uh, and, but uh, and around six and and seven um, degree in Celsius up south. Uh, south, but in in the summer times, it's uh, we have a, a great summer here. We can have a, a temperature higher than thirty degree, but the um, the undisturbed the, the underground uh, temperature is. Uh, at the south is around 10 degrees, and in, in the north we have uh, uh, we are under um, zero uh, degree than the, the freezing point, and we uh, we have a, a permafrost uh, mostly that can reach uh, more than one uh, 100 meter uh, up north. Then, uh, for this reason, we we can um, se uh, separate our research in two main uh, teams. Uh, we have the what we call the northern project and the southern project. Uh, the southern, uh, the northern project is to show uh, that we can uh, operate geothermal system in a, in a cold climate. And and also find solution for uh, seasonal uh, underground uh, energy st storage. Uh, for the southern project, uh, we um, now are working for a cooling system to fight uh, uh, urban heat islands using uh, aquifers, then open loop, and also uh, using uh, uh, closed mines 
that are now flooded. Uh, then in the north, for the northern project, uh, for, uh, how how can we use the geothermal like energy, and and uh, is it possible to operate them in a subarctic climate? Uh, we think then the answer is yes, and the idea is to use the uh, the enthalpy that um, of the underground uh, during the winter season. Because uh, from uh, October to uh, April, uh, the temperature of the underground of the shallow uh, underground is higher than the uh, uh, surface get temperature. Then you can use this uh, positive gain to uh, eat uh, buildings. Uh, one example that we have done. Uh, a couple of years ago is a, a typical uh, northern villagers of uh, Kujuak is to um, then now we we have they characterize the uh, shallow underground then uh, uh, especially the, the thermal conductivity of the soil and the, the bedrock um, and to uh, it, it twists mate. The, the amount of energy that can be extracted by um, heat exchanger of uh, 100 meter deep, and then uh, in um, in modelize and in, in modelize a reference building, then we can then uh, guesstimate how how many um, a drilling is 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 uh, mandatory to uh, to be able to uh, to fill the um, the uh, energy need, the uh, heating needs. Then, in in that case, it uh, it consists to uh, to have a um, uh, underground loop uh, operating in in uh, in minus uh, zero degree, and um, and we think that because there the all the all the heating is uh, is come from. Uh, Furnaces using diesel, then it's it's a, uh, and it costs a lot of money to uh, to bring uh, this uh, fossil fuel in, in the north and to uh, operate it uh, is this and uh, and we um, and and we have evaluated that with uh, if we can have um, the maximum grant the, from the government, it will be uh, possible to have a pay a payback of. Uh, between five or ten years to uh, replace okay, furnaces for uh, heating using um, uh, this kind of a geothermal system. Um, also, uh, right now uh, we uh, we uh, we began uh, last uh, summer the, the first pilot project because before it was just theoretical, uh, but now it's more. Um, uh, real. <laughs> we um, uh, last summer we uh, we um, we installed uh, an horizontal system in um, in in the soil one uh, one meter deep, uh, using coil uh, tubes of uh, a, a total of four kilometer long, for uh, for for hitting a small pool uh, during the, the summer uh, season. Then we uh, we installed the, 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 the system uh, last summer and uh, fall, and uh, we are now uh, monitoring uh, this uh, using um, a cell cables and uh, sensors and in, in, in the in the ground. And uh, next I guess, summer we will uh, operate this system and see uh, what will happen. But uh, we are uh, our uh, modernization. Um, Show that it will be possible to eat the water of the swimming pool for uh, three months during the summer in the, in this northern village. Uh, also, the, um, the the other um, project that we are uh, working on is um, for the underground energy storage. Um, Essentially, a seasonal uh, st st storage of heat in the ground using uh, solar power, uh, uh, solar panels. Then, uh, because in the, in summer in the north we have a very uh, high uh, 
luminosity will have a really high uh, solar energy, but uh, the most of the uh, energy need is uh, during the winter. Then the idea is to, uh, during the summer uh, months, uh, catch the solar energy to uh, eat um, fluid or water to, um, he, in fact, eat the the bedrock, the the the, 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 the underground to store heat and and use it um, in the winter months. Uh, 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 more uh, pre uh, precisely, we we design um, a system uh, for um, uh, uh, because for the um, the drinking water, they uh, they uh, they are using water from a lake that is five kilometer uh, far from uh, to to the village then the then now uh, presently they, they they have to pump it to to put it in the reservoir and eat uh, the water to uh, to uh, to avoid the freezing during the the transport then the idea is to uh, to um, to build a, a, an underground system to um, to replace the dating from uh, furnaces and uh, with the diesel and to um, and to do it uh, entirely with uh, uh, geothermal uh, energy and um, our uh, modulation shows that we we will be able to um, to have a payback of, uh, of around like, 15 years to uh, I get to replace this hit this system but the idea for the future is to uh, identify to find the um, the best uh, use or uh, configuration to um, to um, uh, to install this kind of system but we what what we have to um, to understand that we think that we we, we prove that this kind of stand is feasible for the future for a specific um, uh, utilization in in the south now uh, one project that we are uh, working now is to um, to um, to use aquifer then open loop for uh, cooling a uh, ml system or uh, mostly we, we we think about heat for uh, for eating but also we can use uh, by because in Quebec we we have uh, we uh, a colder climate than our uh, underground is uh, a bit uh, colder. Uh, in, in Quebec City, it's uh, it's around 10, 10 degrees Celsius. But in summer, we we, we have a uh, temperature uh, uh, in the in the, uh, the surface temperature higher than uh, 30 degrees, like in in Europe. And then we um, we have uh, we we experience um, event of. Uh, Heat waves and uh, urban heat island, and uh, then in Quebec City we 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 use the, the, the city and, and the aquifer of the of the city to to prove the technical uh, feasibility for cooling and and also uh, unify the governors uh, issues and uh, to uh, make a, a better uh, uh, rules and uh, regulation for the future. Then uh, here is the Quebec City. We 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 show the the the, the location of the um, where we can find the urban heat island during the summer, and also uh, uh, according to the uh, economic aspect of some neighborhood, we can find uh, where are the. Um, where is the, 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 the place that are more uh, vulnerable for uh, heat waves? Then uh, finally, we um, we, uh, we identify a site to uh, to um, uh, to have a, an injunction test and to uh, to to operate a, a system for uh, uh, for using um, the aquifer. Then uh, the, the site is in a, a future eco district. We project uh, of the city. Then we we uh, this summer we we, we did uh, some work there. Then the idea is that we we um, we drill 
uh, some wells, uh, especially a pumping and uh, knee junction wells, uh, 30 meter deep. Then uh, the idea is to pump uh, water from the aquifer and uh, uh, that goes through a water heater. Then get the water is from 10 degrees and we eat the, um, add the water to 48 degrees and inject the same water uh, warmer in the, in, the, in the aquifer and we um, and we drill also um, observation wells to uh, to show uh, to uh, to be able to see the thermal plume and uh, and be and be able to evaluate the amount of energy that can be uh, extracted from this aquifer then uh, is the configuration of the of the system where the pumping and the injection well with the three uh, observation wells that are uh, that have a lot of uh, sensors we did that uh, last uh, summer and fall and uh, it's a three year project we we are at the middle of the project and and we have a, a different uh, goals then risk and opportunities for the general aquifer in in Canada, and and also identify the the governance issues. Also, uh, had the big problem of chemistry and bacteriology from the uh, the water. And and finally, get predict the the date how much it we can extract from the seed. But they put also at the city scale. Um, then it's uh, ongoing. We are now uh, uh, working on the uh, analysis of the data. Um, finally, we uh, another big project we are working is on uh, closed mines, um, especially uh, uh, open pit that are like uh, big lakes. Uh, we have uh, in, in the in the South Quebec we, we have uh, several mines that are now closed, and uh, then also close to um, the population, the, the cities. Then it's uh, we think a big uh, opportunity for um, the future to uh, to use this water uh, for uh, cooling or uh, heating. Then uh, mostly in the, 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 the geothermal energy project from mines uh, are focused on uh, underground mines because the temperature is higher. But we think that it's we we um, open mine can 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 be a, also a good, a good solution, and we worked uh, on it the, the last year. Um, and uh, what what we did is to um, uh, to calculate the, the volume of, uh, of the water and and with the simulation um, estimate at the amount of the, the the volume of the surrounding rock uh, the bedrock that is disturbed by the temperature and uh, and and the and the idea is the the water of the lake is uh, around five degree. Uh, uh, all year long, even during the winter, because uh, a small amount of ice is uh, on, on the surface, but uh, most most of the lake is uh, not frozen and uh, have uh, still have uh, five degrees in Celsius. And if and and for eating is is to uh, is it, 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 it calculate the amount of energy to uh, to uh, to go from uh, five degree to uh, two degrees. And for and for cooling is the uh, to go from five degrees to uh, twenty degrees, and uh, to estimate the, the 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 amount for of energy for operating this stem over uh, twenty five years. And finally, uh, then we calculate uh, this amount for uh, three different use: the heating uh, with the heat pump and cooling with heat pump, but uh, but also with free cooling. And um, and with uh, a typical buildings, uh, factory, greenhouse, and data center, then we um, we, uh, we, we found that for these three uh, typical buildings, this uh, this mine is um, 
is able to cover uh, most most of the the uh, energy demand for heating or cooling for uh, this kind of uh, buildings. Then we think it's it's something that we uh, we have to uh, look more for the future. We are uh, it, it, it trying to have more grant to uh, to uh, precise uh, to uh, to have um, it, it, uh, to uh, at the end. Uh, Operate the system and prove that uh, it, it can be feasible. But uh, we think it's a, it's a very good uh, path to uh, to take for the for the future. Then uh, that's it. Thank you, and uh, I'm, I would be happy to uh, to answer to your uh, question if you if you have some. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, my question to Vasiliki, are there questions from, from the chat? No, there are no questions. Okay, I would have one question to you. So thank, it was very interesting to see the different ways how to combine uh, geothermal as, as a storage, probably mainly with other energy sources in this northern uh, climate. Um, how is the policy in Canada? Is it is our uh, politicians supporting um, the installment of heat pumps or efficient heat pumps, or is it still very much, uh, um, let's say, depending on, on on fossil fuels also in the next decade? How is the framework in Canada? Well, we we don't have a very big uh, history with the geothermal. Uh, energy yet, then the regulation are quite uh, vague, or uh, mm -hmm. and then um, it's it's something that we want to um, to uh, to precise it uh, to be more uh, uh, detailed. But mm -hmm. right now there's no really a restriction, uh, mm -hmm. especially for shallow um, uh, geothermal and also. Because most of the system now uh, are closed loop, it's mm -hmm. quite simple and, and don't imply the uh, uh, underground. Then it's maybe why uh, we don't have a, a very um, large uh, or detailed uh, regulation yet. But mm -hmm. uh, before the north, uh, I think you uh, you maybe think about the permafrost. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, especially for uh, the storage. Uh, but for uh, where we 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 did work, uh, we are we don't have a permafrost. We, we are uh, very close to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to to that. But then the the maybe to uh, to begin is to uh, uh, it's maybe to uh, find uh, places or a village with no uh, get permafrost for the storage, but also. For a typical geothermal system, if it's if or it's for heating, then you 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 make the the underground colder. Then maybe mm -hmm. it could be a solution to preserve uh, permafrost uh, uh, in the in the future in in some villages if we use a geothermal system because we will make um, the underground mm -hmm. colder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, I'm sorry, we're a little bit behind our schedule. I see there are new questions raising up. Yes, there are. Yes. Uh, maybe, would you like to to have them now or uh, later? Uh, maybe can can I could ask uh, Felix? Could you maybe re reply to these questions during in the chat, and in in the end, uh, uh, we might pick them up again in the final con conclusion. Otherwise, we will run out of time. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I would like to invite the next speaker. So, um, about Carlos, uh, we speak about the introduction of shallow geothermal from a regulation point of view into a new market uh, on the example of uh, Colombia. So, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, would like to give the floor to you. Thanks, Gregor. And I'm not sure if you're, if I'm sharing my, my slides correctly. Um, it's still loading. Maybe give a few moments uh, to to uh, transfer the whole um, content. I'm not seeing your slides in the moment. Check. 
maybe it takes some time for the connection. Or try to stop and restart sharing. Uh, maybe sharing your desktop, desktop desktop is easier if you put it on okay. your desktop. Okay. Sorry. So now you may see something or, or still still loading. Before it worked perfectly. Yeah. Mm. Well, should I share uh, the content? Yeah, I, I think it, it might be better. And in okay. the meanwhile, I, I would like to like to introduce myself. Okay, and great. Say good afternoon to all the members of the geothermal DHC network. And uh, I'm really uh, I, I thanks for this invitation, and I'm very glad to share some. Uh, with ah. you some excuse me carlos now it seems to work okay. i can see your screen okay not in full mode can you activate the full uh, screen mode yes i think it's like it's spending more time than usual because i, I i'm trying to yeah, okay. like you're receiving these like few minutes later. Uh -huh. I, I will I will try to continue mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of time. Mm -hmm. um, like thanks for this invitation, and I am very glad to share with you like some insights um, of a graduate degree project that was um, uh, done by the, by the School of Government of Los Andes University in in Bogota, Colombia. Um, Within the next few minutes, I would like to share with you the results of, would like to address first some regulatory issues uh, uh, of shallow geothermal energy in Colombia, South America. And particularly, I would like to share with you um, the results of a regulatory impact assessment for the deployment of geothermal, of shallow geothermal energy in Colombia. Um, but as Felix has done previously, I would like to, I would like to start with with the Colombian context, with with the background, and uh, like to show you the like the, the basic characteristics of the electric systems in order to to tell you why we were interested in in the in the shallow geothermal energy. And uh, the Colombian electric system is is. Uh, a structure as a competitive market uh, with uh, a lot of private sector participation and uh, this national grid uh, is extremely regulated in my opinion um, the electric colombian system is based upon um, mostly based upon an hydropower uh, as well as as the canada situation that um, felix exposed us previously and it is based upon a, a centralized architecture structure with with a national grid and with very few uh, electric power generators that um, that send this electricity to the national grid and this system uh, brings us uh, many many problems or or have shown many problems throughout the years uh, because this may, may, may translate into uh, transport inefficiencies and uh, like uh, also being so dependent from the hydropower uh, makes us uh, very exposed to uh, dr drought seasons and uh, to like the, the extreme changes in the climate change. So uh, some possible solutions to these uh, problems of, of to these electric uh, system problems uh, are decentralized are, are tend to be more decentralized architecture based upon um, renewable energies so here's where uh, there's uh, 
a lot of interest in, in new renewable energy forms and particularly in, uh, shallow geothermal energy may serve as well. Uh, however, unlike Europe in Colombia, and these may expand to other Latin American countries, um, there is no such shallow geothermal energy market. Um, according to official records, there is only one um, ongoing uh, shallow geothermal energy project in Colombia registered as renewable renewable energy uh, project and I, I think in my opinion this might be weird as there are huge opportunities to deploy this technology in in, in the country maybe like the, the 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 setup is or the settings are are set up to deploy these um shallow to this renewable energy Maybe some some people think differently, uh, but uh, I think the opportunities are there, and I, I just want to to give you some like some facts about the Colombian context in order to to show like uh, the settings in a, in order to enable uh, shallow geothermal energy. For example, 70% of, of Colombian cities are located in zones where cooling is strictly necessary all the year round. In, in Colombia, we, we, we don't have these uh, seasons. We only have like rain or drought seasons, but not uh, as uh, Europe. Uh, also in Colombia, 8% of the electric power is exclusively for for cooling purposes. Um, another fact, 70% of residential spaces uh, electric demands is for air conditioning and 60% of commercial spaces for electric demand is for air conditioning as well. And just talking about for, for the cooling purposes, but there are other industrial uh, needs that maybe heating purposes needs that may be also a, a very interesting fact for the deployment of this renewable energy. So, uh, in, in a nutshell, there is there is a huge like opportunity for for trying to foster this renewable energy. And uh, in, recently, uh, there are some favorable favorable regulations that include uh, tax incentives, quotas. Uh, long-term agreements that may serve as well to introduce this um, uh, renewable energy in the country. But, um, however, these, these regulations have been focused um, in, in photovoltaic centralized sources instead of uh, looking towards other renewable energy sources. So, um, having this context as a background uh, we we then like question ourselves how to promote investment and deployment of shallow geothermal energy in colombia this was like the research problem and um, we decided then to carry out a regulatory impact assessment or regulatory impact analysis in order to answer this question and in this particular case, we decided to follow the OECD guidelines um, for regulatory impact assessment, taking into account all the steps and uh, the strategies that are suggested from the OECD. And the methods that we used uh, to gather information were mostly qualitative research methods that include a document review, a legal document review, regulatory research uh, with uh, uh, national entities, and also um, international literature uh, research. We also uh, used semi-structured interviews with experts from the uh, public sector, from the private sector, and uh, from uh, the academy, from national and international academy. And finally, we used uh, multi-criteria analysis evaluations in order to assess uh, this alternative that we post uh, in, in our research. 
So the starting point of to address this research uh, question was was to examine the statu quo in Colombia and to assess the current situation of, of shallow geothermal energy uh, in the country. So we find out we found that uh, in each of the stages of, of uh, a shallow geothermal energy project, there are several barriers that impede uh, for, for the deployment of these renewable energy. And for example, in, if, if you start in the planning stage of a, of a shallow geothermal energy project, um, you may see that there's a lack of technical knowledge, but not only a lack of technical knowledge from the developers or from the drilling companies, um, but also a lack of technical knowledge in, in, in the entity em, employee, em, employers, employees and uh, mm, in, 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 in the general population, there's, there's a lack of knowledge and awareness of, of these renewable energy. If you continue uh, towards the licensing stage of, of a shallow geothermal energy project, you, you see that, for example, for uh, closed loop systems, there is no certainty over the rights granted. And this happens because it occurs that in Colombia, um, the state is the owner of the, of the subsurface, of the subsoil, and, and of the natural resources as well. It is, it is quite different from the common law tradition uh, system where the landlord is the owner of the, of the subsurface. Uh, so in order to do or in order to use the subsurface without using a natural resource like water, um, you, you need uh, to, to request a concession or, or a licensing that there is uh, currently there is no regulation for, grant, for granting a licensing for 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 a closed loop system but if you go to to the open uh, loop systems um, you then need to go to different procedures that take that takes too long for the licensing you need to first start with uh, requesting a, an exploration licensing in order to um, uh, make the drillings and you need to uh, to do a lot of like a, a lot of activities a developer needs to do a lot of activities and a lot of expenditures in order to uh, finish with the water concession so there, there there's a lot of a lot of bureaucratical barriers that doesn't let these um open loop systems may may may, may be granted easily and if you if you are or if you are interested in 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 getting um, tax benefits for renewable energy projects you need to go to a different entity and you need to uh, in, initiate or start another procedure that it would take a uh, long term also so there is a, a really big problems with the licensing procedures uh, there are different entities for licensing procedures and uh, they're not unified uh, as a one-stop shop um, system and finally if if you go to an, the installation stage of a shallow geothermal energy uh, you you may you may you may you may get with with the barrier of of the high initial investment costs that it is like a, a deal breaking point for for this uh, for the shallow geothermal energy projects so with this in mind based upon these barriers uh, we we set up some alternatives and considering like the es the expert opinions and based on previous international research as uh, the Regio Re Cities project uh, or the Geoplasma C project, uh, we selected some alternatives that uh, may serve to the Colombian context and we tested them based on some criteria such as cost, uh, feasibility, uh, impact, uh, and 
based on these criteria, we weight the results and the respondents or interviewer interviewers consider that the two most important regulatory alternatives to foster the shallow geothermal energy in Colombia are uh, first, and this is like the determining factor, uh, is the financial incentives to capital expenditures um, and also uh, the legal fr framework simplification. These are like the two basic um, or the two most important uh, determining factors for the expert uh, for the experts. But likewise, and another result that we get from the interviews, from the semi-structured interviews, where the, the most important barrier uh, is the lack of knowledge, as I said, the lack of knowledge of this technology and the lack of awareness of this technology, not only in the public entities, uh, not only in the, in the policy decision makers, but also from the general population. Uh, when when you talk about renewable energies the general population like the what they first think in their minds is uh, i want to have my panel in my ceiling or or photovoltaic uh, uh, energy or eolic energy but they, they they are not used to to new types of energy that may serve for their for their conditions and, and situations uh, therefore the interviewers were more likely to propose non-regulatory uh, alternatives to make shallow geothermal energy popular as a cooling or heating alternative. Uh, and as a country, uh, not everything is wrong. Uh, as a country, we are, we are preparing the settings and we are prepar preparing the road for this to happen. Uh, there, there is a, start, a starting interest in distributed energy, uh, recently uh, more interest in geothermal, in shallow, ge well, in, in, in deep and shallow geothermal energy, some in investigation in, in, in the past, in, in the past decade, decades has been done in, in deep geothermal energy, but also recently in shallow geothermal energy, each time you see more investigation uh, geological investigation here in, in Colombia. And um, for instance, um, weeks ago, some weeks ago, the Ministry of Mind has published a, a geothermal regulation for, for comments. Like this, this is a previous uh, stage before enacting uh, the regulation that this geothermal regulation may serve, uh, though, though, even though it's, it, it's like focused on, on deep geothermal energy, it, these regulations may serve as well or may be the first step for a shallow geothermal regulation um, for a shallow geothermal regulation. Therefore, um, there are huge efforts being made. And, and finally, there's, there's another huge effort being made to develop thermal districts based on, upon renewable energy. So there's another a big opportunity there for the shallow geothermal energy to to power these uh, or 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 to to give a, a heating and cooling services to these thermal districts as well. So there there are a lot of opportunities and and hopefully we forecast to see each time more uh, SG projects, shallow geothermal energy projects in Colombia and, and in Latin America, in a Latin American context, and uh, try to learn from the European experience to expand uh, uh, shallow geothermal energy uh, to developing countries. Mm. Thanks for your attention, and I, I would be glad to answer any question regarding these, this project. I will leave here my, mm -hmm. my email for... Uh, thanks a lot, Carlos. So uh, anyway, we, we will share the, the email addresses of all presenters uh, after the meeting with the documentation of the meeting if you want to go get into contact. Um, my question to Vasiliki, are there uh, any questions from the chat room? No, there are no questions. Oh, okay, I would like to ask you one question, Carlos. So you, you were mentioning groundwater use also for cooling, uh, for cooling um, purposes. Yes. 
Uh, is there a possible conflict with drinking water supply? Are the same aquifers used also for drinking water supplies, especially in urban areas? Or you would not see this so much as a problem at, based on the hydrogeological conditions in Colombia? Yes, well, like the geological conditions of, of the, the, the main cities of Colombia is not my expertise, but mm -hmm. uh, mostly uh, the cities, the, 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 like the water supply cities systems that I know are, are, are from, from nearby lakes and are not, it's not usual that are, are, are part from aquifers that are like near the city. Uh, but I think, like in the main cities, this might not be a problem, you know. But mm -hmm. like you, you need to consider each 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 situation like specifically. Yes. yes. Yeah. And and for the heating purposes, I, I just one final question: Do you consider would it be part of a strategy uh, to use? Uh, heat, excess heat by cooling, for instance, for domestic water, hot water production during night times? Or, uh, yes. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yes, uh, that, that will serve as well also. It, it would be... Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot, Carlos. I see there were more questions in the chat room. Uh, uh, to stick into the time schedule, I would like to ask, Carlos, that you would also answer these questions uh, directly in the chat chat room. Um, so, uh, and we would like, I would like to switch to the next presentation. Now we come to the Canary Islands and I welcome Alejandro to speak about shallow geothermal energy use in the Canary Islands. I will Sh stop sharing my screen and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Gregor. Mm. Welcome. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Alejandro Garcia Gil from the Geological Survey of Spain. I'm going to talk about soil geothermal energy use in the Canary Islands. <clears throat> what? Um, can you see the next slide? Are you still? Uh, so? No, sorry, still the first slide. Maybe there was some delay in the delivery of the pictures. Now I think... Ah, now I see it. Now it works. I think you have to wait a few moments and it's a little bit... Uh, okay. ...behind real time. Okay. Well, soil geothermal energy, it's especially relevant in small islands that depend to a high degree on energy imports. In fact, the European Union recognized the special and very vulnerable role that the EU islands have in the context of the clean energy transition. On the one hand, climate change impacts are stronger on small islands, which very much depend on the local ecological systems. On the other hand, energy transition faces more challenges in islands as they are conditioned by smaller economies and the lack of geographical connection to neighborhood regions for joint smart energy networks. Moreover, energy demand profiles might be different from mainland regions when islands are used for touristic purposes. For all that reasons, in 2017, the European Commission, together with 14 EU member states, signed uh, the political declaration on clean energy for the EU islands. The declaration emphasized the integration of local renewable energy sources together with empowerment of island communities so that they become a part of the energy transition, of their own energy transition. The declaration also acknowledges the opportunities offered by a transition to clean energy supply as it's able to reduce the dependency of the import of fossil fuels, which often leads to high energy energy costs. And this transition also introduces green jobs, thus uh, 
I think to the touristic sector as a way to diversify the employment situation. In comparison with the, EU, with the European Parliament, the EU Commission set up a secretariat specifically for clean energy of EU islands initiative. And in 2019, the secretariat published the first handbook of clean energy transition agendas to support regional communities in their transition to uh, in their transition from planning to citizen involvement. Okay. Sorry, but it doesn't. Oh, it, it takes a, some time to mm -hmm. to update, so I will continue. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, well, uh, it takes your second. It takes a, a lot to update. Yes, sure. I, if, if you like, I can also share this screen on my computer, and you talk to it if it doesn't get better. Okay, that could be a solution. Yeah, let me just uh, open it. Let me see for full screen. Okay, uh, let's try it like this. Maybe it can be a little bit quicker. Uh, sorry for that. I will share my screen now. And you will see your presentation. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Just tell me to click and I will activate the full screen mode. That is more convenient to see. Okay. We are in uh, number three, slide number three. Uh, this presentation will focus on uh, the case study of the Canary Islands as a representative, representative example of the European islands suffering from large dependence of on import energy. Throughout this presentation, I will provide evidence of the efficient heating and cooling of touristic infrastructures using geothermal energy. A total of nine systems transi transi tra doing the transition from conventional heat production facilities to geothermal energy systems have been investigated and the energetical, economic, and environmental advantages of this transition were calculated from operation data sets in order to discuss the exceptional value of South geothermal energy as a successful strategy, even in volcanic environments and with low promotion policy of this technology. Next slide, please. The Canary Islands archipelago is constituted by eight islands covering an area approximately of 7,500 square kilometers. They are located approximately 1,400 kilometers from the nearest coast of the European continent and 100 kilometers from the west coast of the African continent. In geological terms, the archipelago emerged from hot zone associated to a residual thermal plume, which has been active since the beginning of the Atlantic, the, the Atlantic Ocean opening 200 million years ago. Next slide. Please, the, the rock types found in the Canary Islands cover, the, cover a full range of typical oceanic alkaline suites. And in this work, uh, nine successful geothermal energy systems in the islands of Fuerteventura and Lanzarote are described. The geological history of these islands are rel is relatively simple as they are almost completely formed from basaltic rocks generated from magma emissions produced from the Miocene up to the current days. Next slide, please. South geothermal energy resources are strongly related to groundwater for the, due to heat affection. Therefore, groundwater regime in soil aquifers should be well understood before the design of soil geothermal energy systems. And this is the, usually the main challenge for the use of in, in volcanic areas since groundwater resources are typically scarce. Most of the Lanzarotes and Fuerteventura's existing groundwater wells present low production rates, about one uh, cubic meter per day, and the hydraulic conductivities found are in the range of 0 0.001 to 0 0.5 meters per day. 
this low probability explains why the groundwater level is, is located between two and 10 meters deep. And higher probabilities can be found in the coast where groundwater is used for industrial purposes, including geothermal use. In the next slide, please. Uh, a total of nine representative case studies, as I said, uh, of touristic infrastructure, infrastructures using solid thermal energy were selected in this work. And the, there are selected uh, representing hotel complexes, shopping centers, water parks, and wineries. The majority of, of these installations identified in the, Can in the Canary Islands are hotel resorts. These installations typically demand the heating of water in swimming pools throughout the year. Also, these hotels can be found as building blocks. They are usually found as resorts. These are several small buildings surrounded by sports and leisure facilities framed in green areas. These typical arrangements in the Canary Islands a result in distant heating and cooling micro networks. In the next slide. Uh, in this figure, uh, it summarizes the typical heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems based on groundwater heat pump system and used in hotel resorts in the Canary Islands. Systems make use of well doublets to pump groundwater from shallow aquifers with background temperatures about 22 degrees Celsius by means of water to water plate heat exchangers. And heat is transferred to the, the geothermal heat pump system that provides cold for, for uh, heating, and ventilation, and air conditioning systems of the hotel facilities by retrieving waste heat, which is collected from the geothermal heat pump, tap water is preheated to produce domestic hot water and to heat up the swimming pool's water. Additionally to this waste heat recovery, solar collectors are sometimes also used to produce domestic water and the, the um, swimming pool water heating. The rest of heat is produced during the operation of geothermal pump. Heat pumps is rejected to the uh, heat plate to the plate heat exchangers and then projected into the coastal aquifer from of, uh, in the form of heated groundwater, usually at 24 to 30 degrees Celsius. Next slide. Under the category of hotel resorts, five installations were considered as representative uh, facilities. The first system is a 15 store building with a total of 164 rooms, shopping area, spa, swimming pool. It's located in the, in, in the island of Lanzarote. It's a groundwater heat pump system with a well tablet and the installed thermal power is 876 kilowatts for cooling, 1,066 for heating. And in summer, geothermal heat pump supplies chill water for air conditioning of common areas, rooms, and so during the winter, the geothermal heat pump changes the operation mode to heating and extract, extract heat from groundwater for pool water heating and domestic heat water production. Next. The second case study is a hotel complex, also uh, in, the, in Lanzarote, in Puerto del Carmen, which is the main tourist town in the island of Lanzarote. Uh, it has uh, 41, uh, 14 one-story buildings that are equipped with geothermal heat pumps with a uh, capacity of 691 kilobytes for cooling, 849 for heating, and the cooling and heating system is based on groundwater heat pump technology. But in this case, swimming pool water heating and domestic heat water is produced by solar collectors. And next, a third hotel resort was also studied in Puerto del Carmen. It's uh, also a hotel resort of 211 rooms and different block buildings between swimming pools and common areas. And here the capacity is about 500 uh, 
kilowatt for cooling and 600 for heating. Next, it's uh, another hotel that have 253 kilobytes for cooling, 300 for heating. You can see that they are almost very similar. In this case, we have three heating systems that uh, includes uh, solar collectors for domestic hot water and the pools, and also uses uh, gas fire boilers for uh, legal restrictions of Legionella. And and, and also residual heat is used from the geothermal heat pump for the for the goods. Next slide is uh, the, the last hotel we have studied. It's uh, uh, a hotel building with 115 rooms, and these have similar capacity of 275 kilowatts for cooling and 325 kilowatts for heating. Next, uh, other, a second type of, of system uh, are the shopping centers. We have investigated two of them. The, the first half um, start capacity of 1,498 kilowatts for cooling and 1,882 kilowatts for heating. It's a more uh, big installation, larger in installations. And, and this time uh, it's uh, giving service about 5,500 uh, square meters surface uh, for the shopping center. Next slide, please. Yes, we'll, uh, so we, we can see a second system of a shopping center and also have an important uh, uh, capacity, but the, in this time also only for cooling, 1,285 kilowatts. Next, this will be the, the water parks. We have studied one of them, and this also only used uh, the groundwater for, for heating, 450 kilowatts capacity. And finally, we only have I've uh, studied one closed loop system and it's much uh, smaller installation, 35 kilobytes for cooling, 15 for heating. Next, please. Well, uh, to prove the possibly successful implementation of, of solar geothermal energy in district heating and cooling micro networks in touristic islands, uh, energy balance and economic viability assessments were performed for these nine touristic infrastructure zone. Each micro network was considered as an energy system uh, equipped with various components for the generation, distribution and emission of heat. And the energy analysis was applied to the whole system with a special focus on generation of of, of the generation component replacement for from conventional fossil fuel to renewable solar geothermal energy technology. The system has been fully monitored throughout one year for both conventional and solar geothermal energy uh, micro networks and the parameters the parameters measure include temperature of the inlet outlet water of the heat generation equipment and the primary and secondary side of the loops of the systems and the next slide please uh, for the analysis of each DHC micro networks studied the whole system performance was assessed by the co the coefficient of performance of the of the whole network and uh, according to this equation where uh, it takes account in the heat produced from the generation equipment the the heat provided by solar collectors uh, the heat recovered from the generation equipment heat losses through the pipelines acting as a distribution network, primary energy required for heat generation in conventional systems, electrical work, power used for geothermal heat exchanger pumps, power for the fan coils and power used for distribution pumps through the network. 
the next slide also shows the that the energy demand of the STD systems can fluctuate over the year, so it's more appropriate or, or it's appropriate to consider the 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 seasonal uh, performance factors, which one is uh, for cooling and for heating. Uh, <clears throat> When gas fire boilers are used the, in the district heating and cooling micro networks, seasonal space heating energy efficiency is calculated. And finally, the annual COP of the systems could be in, uh, was calculated as the annual performance factor. Next, please. The economic environment, uh, environmental savings were obtaining assuming the existing electricity price and the CO2 emission factors in the Canary Islands and the economic savings obtained allowed to assess the capital intensive scenarios of each case studied by means of common project profitability indices and we decided to use the net present value, internal rate of return and payback period. Next, here we see the, the main results obtained from the thermal balance and the comparative analysis conducted of, of all the systems. It can be observed that the yearly total cooling demand of the nine district heating and cooling systems is 4.4 giga, thermal gigawatts, while the heating demand is 5.2. This is a 9% heating bias from the balance demand. And also it can be seen that shopping centers present the highest thermal energy demand over three times higher than those from hotels and almost two orders of magnitude higher than the domestic small industry system. The energy consumption of conventional district heating and cooling system are, allows to evaluate the annual performance factors and we can see that positively increase on average about 41 percent from 1.7 to 4.2 in this uh, transition in this transition and uh, from conventional to solid thermal energy systems increase the 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 energy savings about 3.5 gigawatts per year this is about 30 40 percent savings leading to uh, 600,000 euros per year savings is 2,500 2, tons of CO2 savings also. This savings clearly underpin the economically attractive description of the heating and cooling energy sector and justify the promotion of geothermal energy in volcanic energy dependent islands. Next, um, very uh, fast, uh, we saw uh, some figures of the results we had that the, for example this figure shows the thermal energy produced and the energy consumed by the conventional and shall geothermal and distant heating and cooling micro networks during the cooling season the heating season and throughout the year in this figure, linear relationships can be identified between the thermal energy provided to buildings and the energy consumed by both conventional and shallow geothermal energy systems. Each technology presents different slope with a value of 0 0.87 for conventional and 2.9 for shallow geothermal systems. The linear relationship indicates that those technologies represent proportion, present proportional performance as the size increases the, the, the heating capacity. And this figure also shows that the higher performance in cooling than heating. This effect is also observed in both conventional and shallow geothermal installations. In the next slide, uh, we can see a figure that compares decisional and annual performance found in case investigated. Regarding the seasonal performance factor values of the system, this clearly indicates that the renewable energy transition is more efficient for cooling. This difference can also be seen in the linear regression slope of the seasonal performance values, 
with the cooling ones being 33% higher. And those systems also present, the geothermal energy systems present an increased rate of 3.7 times higher than the conventional systems. When annual performance factors are, are considered, uh, well, geothermal district heating and cooling micro networks are 2.3 times more efficient than conventional ones, that, thus explaining the significant energy savings of solar. Next, please. Uh, finally, we can see that the economic analysis results are shown in this table. On average, according to the economic savings of 52,000 euros per year, it takes uh, 3.7 years to, to regain the, the initial investment of 0 0.16 million euros to accomplish the energy transition objective by using solar geothermal energy in the case studies. The minimum payback period is 2.1 years for uh, for the shopping center is the biggest installation. It's also half the, 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 lower, the lowest uh, payback period and three times higher than the closed system, which is the smallest one. The net present value of 0 0.63 and 0 0.93 million euros on average for 15 and 25 year project lifetimes are obtained up to 2.2 million euros in the case of the shopping center, the biggest installation for a 25 year net uh, percent value. On the other hand, uh, this 15 and 25 year internal rate of return value, so an investment rate higher than 14, 30, and average up to 40, 48%. So in prof profitable uh, investment rates. And finally, the, uh, as a conclusion, we can state that this study demonstrates that the energy transition from conventional to shallow geothermal technology in nine district heating micro networks studied is cost effective. Result, results of the comparative study perform, performed so a 40% reduction in the energy consumption in the investigated heating and cooling system that made this transition to shallow geothermal energy systems. The nine systems investigated reduced their energy requirements significantly, uh, shifting from six gigawatts to 2.6 gigawatts, with resulting 600,000 euros uh, and 2,500 tons of CO2 savings. And the, the, the coefficient of performance sold is shows that uh, those geothermal energy systems are about four times more efficient than conventional systems that use uh, air to water heat pumps, air condensed liquid, chills, cooling towers, and gas boilers. Uh, the financial value of the investment was evaluated using three indicators um, that uh, showing that on average 3.7 years of payback period or, and that the payback is clearly compensated by the performance advantage, advantage, advantages of, of, of shallow geothermal energy systems. Therefore, financial incentives are required to overcome the already known development barrier. And finally, this work provides evidence of the economical, energetical, and environmental advantages of using geothermal energy in volcanic islands and serves as the basis for roadmap for energy planners in volcanic islands. It also demonstrates the feasibility of such type of thermal installation and their ability to satisfy the enormous, the huge heating and cooling demands of tourism throughout the year in, in, in the Canary Islands. So geothermal energy, its technology is available to be considered in the energy plans requiring the current energy decarbonization, decarbonization scenario 
and thus uh, helping to meet the the clean energy transition agenda the EU is demanding. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. A very, very fascinating, interesting presentation. Uh, we are already in the break, uh, but I would ask either if you if there are immediate one immediate or two immediate questions, maybe we can also use the break time. So those who, who would like to grab a coffee or so can can leave in a moment. Um, but and I would also like to ask you and your on your co-authors, Alejandro, that if you could also comment the questions in the chat room so we can collect the answers as well for those people who would be present uh, who not be present in the moment so um we would resume at uh, in five minutes we have a short break but um basiliki we can in the meantime maybe uh, take one or two questions are there any questions in the chat room yes uh, there are a few questions uh, you can start from the first one uh, with uh, the open loop systems, uh, were there any problems with the water quality encounter, like uh, clogging, corrosion, fooling, etc.? Well, for uh, since the, these systems are located in coastal aquifers, it's true that uh, this uh, could be a problem with the corrosion, but the system used. Uh, plate heat exchangers of titanium and uh, this prevented the, the corrosion and also uh, uh, the, the, the quality of groundwater pumped since it's reinjected again into the aquifer is not a consumptive uh, use of groundwater uh, the, the, there is no uh, change in the, the there's no uh, change in the in the groundwater salinity okay or um, not, not very uh, important change in the salinity while these systems operate mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and uh, another question. Uh, question: Do you have uh, any technical detail on the solution used in the in the big plants, like uh, the geometries of the borehole uh, heat exchanger, the depth the evaluation of the interaction, uh, and the evolution in time of the thermal plume? Uh, we don't have uh, an evaluation an assessment of the of the thermal plumes generated some of the systems are very close one to others because some hotels are next to others and there is no uh, impact assessment in terms of thermal plumes uh, and in real what uh, you are asking about the the, the geometry of the heat exchangers, the open loops for the geothermal <coughs> uh, This is not included in the study, but we just uh, get the information mainly for the operation of the systems from from the geothermal heat pumps, basically to to assess the the energy energetical uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, do we have time for another question? Or uh, we have. We are in a break, so those people who are not not gone for a coffee, we and if Alejandro, you do, if you still have time, we can take yeah. another question in the break. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Then, uh, how deep well? Uh, how deep the wells are needed uh, to supply water to the open loop, loop systems? And uh, what are the cap rock of the aquifer, considering that these are solely volcanic rocks existing there? Well, the, the wells are very shallow, are about 40 meters deep. It depends on the, but uh, they are uh, relatively high permeability coastal aquifers, very different from the land parts. And uh, is not affected by uh, volcanic uh, geothermal events. I mean that that we we, have, we can understand that that many people think that 
many people think that when you speak about geothermal uh, energy in volcanic islands, you are uh, directly talking about deep geothermal energy and high geothermal gradients. But th this study or tries to show that uh, this is not uh, to uh, any point related to geothermal gradients. It's more to groundwater that mainly have, yes, it's a little bit higher. It's temperature that uh, annual mean temperature, but it's not much different than continental uh, framework. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Alejandro. Maybe um, if you could, if there are some open questions, please answer them in the chat room or we can use okay. the chat room for further questions. I will also have two more questions to you, Alejandro, but I will write them in the chat room. And uh, okay. we proceed with our program. Coming to the second half uh, of our webinar, and now moving towards continental Europe, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to to give the floor to Joao, uh, who will speak about sustainability of shallow geothermal energy use and its governance, with uh, a special reference uh, to Portugal. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Gregor. I will start sharing now. Yep, great. It's good, Works. right? Good. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this invitation. Nice to meet you all. So I integrated this uh, cost action uh, just a while ago, so I will uh, seize the opportunity to, to present myself and present my work. So today I'll, I'll be talking about sustainability of shell geothermal energy use and its governance. But I will start talking about my PhD, still undergoing. So um, I will focus on shallow geothermal energy as a multidisciplinary challenge. So I will uh, study the context, the shallow geothermal resources specifically in Portugal, and then legal framework, technical guidelines and incentive schemes. Then I will uh, focus on the ground and the heat transfer mechanisms and thermal properties, uh, the evaluation of uh, these properties and uh, the heat transfer processes in these types of energy systems. Then about infrastructure and thermal comfort, building uh, heating and cooling needs and the technologies available to supply them. And at the end, I will uh, see the energy system, the equipment, the sustainability, the performance and the design methodology. So the main um, objective is to create a transversal guide for the technology with specific contributes across uh, a number of areas where knowledge gaps currently exist. So, and the specific objectives are these, I'll be talking, I have just a check sign here for the ones that are already done. So I will talk about the sustainability and try to propose a set of measures to guarantee its sustainability. So the sustainability of shallow geothermal energy usage. This is the index. So I will be talking about this, uh, the global context of uh, shallow geothermal energy. And then I will talk about its sustainability. At the end, I will talk about how can we manage the shallow geothermal energy resources and the technology deployment and market development. At the end, I will have final remarks and I will ask for collaboration inside the cost action towards uh, one specific uh, study that uh, I want to do on my PhD. So to start, we have on our right uh, several uh, current challenges on our society regarding energy sector and regarding urbanization. And uh, today we see that there's a lot of uh, search for more sustainable, environmentally friendly energy sources. And this is a constant concern today. And uh, if we focus on space heating and space cooling and hot uh, water, 
uh, these are the biggest share of energy consumption in European households. And it represents also a very big uh, share on other types of infrastructures like services, industry and transportation. The problem is that almost 75% of this energy used for space heating and cooling uh, in Europe um, derived from carbon intensive energy sources. And this is a problem regarding our energy transition and climate change uh, fight. And if we talk about worldwide, this uh, share uh, even grows further to 88%, accounting only with coal, natural gas and oil technologies. So available renewable energy sources for heating and cooling have different advantages and disadvantages. And we have to take this into consideration when choosing the one to install. So let's see, um, let's uh, now check shallow geothermal energy. So uh, shallow geothermal energy represents a clean and ecological alternative for heating and cooling. So um, it seizes the exploitable heat or cool from the subsurface uh, resources. And from one part of electricity, we can produce four to five parts of thermal energy. And I've seen some examples that this number can be even higher. And we have different types of systems for different types of purposes, accommodating um, different kinds of needs. So shallow geothermal energy is a viable answer to effectively supply renewable heating and cooling, whether alone or complemented by other technologies. Uh, as we've seen today, and uh, we've seen a lot of information on the first part of this webinar, uh, it already has some important mature markets and some under development, like Portugal. It's still uh, a child, a baby on this. So uh, let's continue talking about the sustainability of shallow geothermal energy. And for that matter, I would like to uh, point out some characteristics. So um, these systems are always um, a mix between the requirements of the building, so the needs, uh, the availability of the source, so the uh, availability of the um, subsurface to act as a heat source or a cool source or an energy storage um, medium. And also we have to take into account the characteristics of the equipment. All these three combined give us uh, a sustainable answer for our needs. So this is site specific. It depends on geological conditions. It depends on the thermal conductivity we have on the ground, for instance, and also it is multidisciplinary, um, like, like uh, my thesis focus on a lot of things, even political reasons. And uh, this is super complex because it has a lot of factors uh, on this. This is uh, misspelled, but it's renewable and efficient when we have a sustainable and success installation. It, this uh, technology doesn't ha really have a visual impact when we uh, compare it with um, air uh, heat pumps, for instance. Uh, it can have production 24-7, so uh, it doesn't depend on uh, whether there's sun or whether there's wind. Um, it can also be centralized or decentralized solution and can be exploited virtually everywhere. So this is interesting, but also um, the, its usage comes with some consequences that we need to understand and we need to control it to have successful projects. So um, the operation of shallow geothermal energy can have technical, social and political and environmental consequences. I bring some to talk with you. So in terms of social and political consequences, uh, there's this um, uh, consequence that we cannot um, uh, avoid. So the usage of the underground space and the underground space is being 
uh, more and more exploited in uh, big urban centers. So we need to manage this, the, the underground space and the underground resources. We need also organizational uh, market support for the technology itself. We need the access to the underground space to be managed and to be um, controlled. And we need to look at underground urbanization. It is um, a, a, a recent um, focus that we need to, to increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, important on urban centers. So in terms of technical uh, consequences, we can have local over-exploitation if we uh, don't understand the capability of the soil um, to um, supply heat or cool. So we can create a local thermal anomaly and this can be big enough to influence neighboring systems and also uh, big enough for us to decrease our energy efficiency of our system. In terms of environmental consequences, we uh, must look at the water quality if we are using the groundwater for uh, drinking uh, reasons. There's also this uh, possibility of, have, of creating a connection between different aqu aquifers and this can also change the, um, the properties of the water. And also uh, there's this um, possibility of leakage most uh, loop systems where the heat transfer fluid can um, can can go to the ecosystem, and this is also a problem. So, as we can see, it is essential to have a long term management and monitoring of this these energy systems to guarantee its sustainability. So, as uh, Gregor. Uh, also said that governance is one of the major driving factors and future assets to develop the Schalger thermal energy market. And also, Carlos Luna talked a little bit about this. For me, uh, the governance has these six um, questions that need to be addressed. So I will start talking about the legal definition and ownership. So uh, it is important to have a clear and harmonized uh, definition of shallow geothermal energy. Otherwise, the market will, be, uh, will have no support. This figure here is from a, a, an article I did, a paper I did um, in other cost action. So the previous one regarding shallow geothermal energy. And we did... Um, uh, a survey between the countries we uh, present on the cost action, and we uh, identified this problem of definition. So, as you can see, uh, we have the countries here and its definition, if there is one, and then there's the depth um, uh, that I used for, as a threshold for the, the definition itself. So, um, this um, definition needs to be clear and needs to be harmonized. And we have a lot of different types of definitions here. And this doesn't help the market at all. And um, I also can say that this definition can be uh, also done with other parameters. So instead of, of depth, we have some um, uh, definitions where we have the installed capacity as a threshold, the system size or the temperature of the, um, the shallow geothermal energy resource. So um, this needs to be harmonized. And not only, uh, it has to include the ownership uh, of the underground space. And this is uh, a question, as I said before, we need to focus uh, more and more on that. So um, I would like, on this matter, I would like to talk about three uh, papers here that I identify as good practices. Uh, so the first one, uh, Hanlin uh, did, and others did um, a very good paper on this, and he, they proposed this um, legal framework for shallow geothermal energy use where they define the different types and the different uh, types of uh, systems and usages 
um, in, and they divided this uh, legal framework into six different levels where they would have the type, the usage, the size, the technical assessment and an environmental assessment needs, and also the licensing. Um, I invite you all to read this. Uh, now talking about the second one, Lee and others also did a very good job when they studied the sustainable the underground urbanization based on asset valorization to foster urban development. And they identified four main resources we have uh, on the underground space. We have groundwater, we have geomaterials needed for construction and all sorts of um, applications. We have shallow geothermal energy and also space for infrastructures. So um, underground urbanization needs to take into account these assets in order to do uh, underground planning for urban centers. And this is important for us to uh, claim ownership or define availability of usage for the underground space. And at the end, Alcaraz and also others uh, defined and proposed the method to establish a market of shallow geothermal energy use rights. And this is also a paper that I invite you all to read. Talking about the second part, the access to the source. So uh, when we talk about the access to the source, we need to regulate it. And um, so we need to create some kind of licensing or permitting system. And we have already several different approaches across, across Europe to a licensing scheme for the exploitation of shallow geothermal energy. And um, some of these existing regulations present uh, inappropriate too long and complicated procedure for obtaining a license or declaration. For instance, I would like to talk about France and the city of Stockholm. In France, they um, adopted a simpler and less complicated um, permitting system where uh, they, they identified the small systems using thresholds like the system size, and uh, the needs of the infrastructure. Um, and then you could get just a declaration for the usage of the shallow geothermal energy um, resource. The city of Stockholm, for instance, they have an online service uh, that you could um, also get a license for your system. Uh, so in an online system, uh, you can get uh, a super easy process to get this uh, licensing. Of course, we can talk also about large scale projects where these simplified processes are no longer um, uh, sustainable. So we need to take into account technical and environmental assessments. And on these, I would like to talk about Denmark where they have a mandatory um, yearly inspections, and this is very important to understand also during the operation, what kind of consequences we can have on large scale shallow geothermal energy projects. <clears throat> Talking about technical specifications, so we need to ensure the sustainable success of these projects from its design to the installation, operation, maintenance and monitoring. Additional Additionally, it is important to have a clear view of the roles and responsibilities of the several teams involved in a project like this. So um, it is important to claim uh, responsibility uh, of the different tasks and also the different um, types of assessments. Uh, and we can talk about the environmental assessment. It, it is responsibility of which team so this, these questions are very important. And some European member states already have their own guidelines and some independent bodies have produced some documents with this objective. I, talk, I, I recall here the VDI norms from Germany. We have the standards from 
the GHSPA um, association. We have GeoTrainNet, a very interesting project where they produced also some very good um, standards and, and we have the standards from uh, Switzerland. So it is important to have national guidelines regarding shallow geothermal energy deployment and not only use uh, the ones outside of our country because they need to be adjusted to the specific climate conditions, stages of development, built environment that we have on our country, the financial resources we have, and also the policy national framework. And this goes along with the definition of shallow geothermal energy that we need to have. And also national guidelines should focus on integrating this energy in national building regulations and urban planning. Good. <clears throat> to have a, a totally functioning um, market, we need to have specialized workforce. So one of the major barriers for the development of shallow geothermal energy is the lack of professionals and technic uh, technical people on this. So an, integ an integrated system of training activities and respective certification is key for the sustainability and the success of shallow geothermal energy deployment and development. Several types of training and certification is needed when we uh, talk about designing, dr drilling, installing, uh, also managing the operation and the maintenance. So trainings, uh, on all sorts of areas and on, during the lifetime of the project, it is important. We have also some significant efforts to address this in some European member states, and I have some examples here. And also these uh, countries are uh, together trying to, to contribute to GeoTrainNet. GeoTrainNet is um, an European-wide platform that intends to create this um, system of training and certification. Um, from, my, from, from my knowledge, I guess uh, it is not being sufficiently um, uh, territory. Um, it's not sufficiently covering all the territory we have in Europe. And this is a problem, and I talk about Portugal, of course. Um, the, and we can link this to the licensing schemes. So the license can, um, should require certified personnel on the deployment team of Challenger Thermal Energy projects. And ideally, these uh, specialized workforce will ensure um, high standards of shallow geothermal energy systems, which is vital for the continuously growth of this uh, technology. <clears throat> now talking about management, uh, to ensure sustainable usage of shallow geothermal resources, a precautionary strategy is needed to prevent any detrimental consequences from the installation and operation of shallow geothermal energy systems. I recall here a paper from a colleague of ours that just finished his presentation. So, um, and he proposed, and others, of course, uh, they proposed this double adaptive um, concept, uh, double adaptive cycle uh, concept to accommodate the dynamic and complex um, character of shallow geothermal energy systems, where we have this iterative uh, management process on the management planning cycle and also on the implementation and control cycle. This is more on site and this is more like a regional or national um, environment. Uh, so this is a, a good approach to manage um, the shallow geothermal energy resources. And I would like also to talk about what some uh, European member states have been doing. So they have been adopting some precautionary strategies and measures to address the potential consequences of these systems. For instance, we have here um, 
uh, from Han Lane um, a paper as well. So we have here some thresholds of the accepted temperature changes on the underground. Um, so we have here the case of Austria, Denmark, France, Germany. So some of them and uh, have already these thresholds of uh, admitted uh, temperature changes um, induced by these systems. And this is important, maybe not so strict, but it is important to have these uh, thresholds to control and prevent any detrimental consequences of the operation of shallow thermal energy. And also from um, our article from the cost action, uh, the previous cost action, we have here also the, the distance and the restriction of distance between our energy system and different kinds of uh, reference points. For instance, the property border, the building outside the property area, some infrastructures from uh, pipelines, water supply, and also railway area. So these are um, measures that we can have to prevent the consequences we talked before. Uh, Shao, uh, yes. two minutes left. I'm sorry, we 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 are okay. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, mm -hmm. I almost finishing. <laughs> so, and regarding the last point of the governance, we need to focus on market development as well. So, we need to nurture its market and create a sustainable roadmap to really uh, get a, a good perspective on our environmental targets, and these. I would like to recall that dissemination, like webinars like these, are very important, and our and activities, technical and organizational support are important, and availability of data, incentives, and creation of a specific national target towards solar thermal energy. And I have uh, other uh, important things. But I would like to recall that financial incentives, like Carlos Luna was saying, um, they they show a, they show a good um, a good measure at developing the market of solar geothermal energy technologies, and the same has happened in the case of other renewable energy technologies. So, as final remarks, um, and I have more to say, not only this, uh, this more or less. Um, resumes what I've been uh, saying. So uh, shallow geothermal is uh, uh, one answer we can have towards our uh, climate change fight, uh, but they have consequences and we need to manage it. And I just proposed some uh, good practices that we could learn from. As, uh, as a final uh, touch, I would like to ask the collaboration of the, um, the cost action. I want, I have in hands two case studies, uh, district case studies uh, in Lisbon. I have this first one that is uh, intended for refurbishment and I have the heating and cooling needs um, in three scenarios as the buildings are, buildings with um, wall insulation and wall insulation and better windows. And my intention is to create, uh, at least study the suitability of having here a low temperature uh, geothermal uh, district heating and cooling system. Also, on the second case study, and this is a new built environment where we have 70% residential and 30% services. And... Uh, these, uh, this um, need, uh, this necessity of asking for your collaboration be is because I never worked with district heating and cooling before. So I, I would like to have your collaboration on that in order to have the, the right results and in order to have the best impact uh, we can on these case studies. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be available for your doubts. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, Rao. Uh, very good overview, and, and it's interesting, and I'm looking forward to include your case studies from Lisboa in, into the action. I think there will be sure the possibility. Um, we are a little bit behind of schedule again. Um, Basilica, is there maybe one quick question we can take from the chat room? Uh, we don't have any questions. We have comments uh, okay. uh, in the chat room. Okay, uh, maybe um, I would like to ask you one very quick question, uh, a brief answer. Where do you where do you put Portugal in this governance landscape of the of of the European Union? Are you at the very beginning part, or are there any things which are quite developed already when it comes to governance of shallow tree firmer? Well, uh, it is a very good question. Portugal is, uh, like I said, the baby on shallow geothermal energy, and for now we don't even have a clear definition of shallow geothermal energy. It has been proposed um, a new regulation where they would include uh, this definition, but it, is, it has not been accepted yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, as governance, uh, this is the set further, so no, we don't have. Mm -hmm. We just have groundwater uh, protection policies, but we are having shallow geothermal energy systems uh, without any licensing or without any supervision from technical people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. And please, uh, yeah. for further questions, uh, Shao, also please have a look at the chat uh, room and, and you may answer the questions there. Okay. So now we come to the next talk. We we move from Portugal to Italy, and uh, it's also a great pleasure to ha um, invite now Marco uh, to speak about. Uh, uh, we go now to the construction works to couple sh the sh sub shallow subsurface with from an energy use based on on subsurface infrastructure like uh, a metro tunnels. And I thanks again. Yeah, you already share your screen. Great. But okay, you're still muted. Now you're not yeah. muted. You, you you hear me, don't you? Yes, I hear you now. Uh, okay, good. And you also see the screen. Yep. Yeah. Good. Works so well. thank you for the introduction and uh, nice meeting all of you. Uh, so yes, I'm from the Technical University in Torino, Polytechnico, and um, my short presentation is probably slightly uh, still shallow geothermal energy, but uh, slightly different from what we saw earlier, as uh, we, I'm going to talk about um, the topic of energy geostructures. So is that um, the idea of um, implementing the thermal exchanger into a structure which, is, which already exists? Uh, some, someone anticipated earlier about the drilling costs and the idea here is that if we try to use a structure that we're going to build for other reasons, for example, a tunnel lining, as you see in this picture here, then um, you, you, we can, let's say, save something from, from the drilling cost point of view. So, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I, I think you, the, the slides are going to be shared, so I just put here a few a reference with respect to, to what I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about. So energy geostructures. Uh, it was anticipated earlier. There was another construction which already finished a year ago. It was called the uh, Gabi, um, and in that construction we face it directly the energy geostructures. So we talked a lot about that and. If, if if we want to um, let's say to define what those are, it's those are geotechnical structures, a pile, a retaining wall, a tunnel lining, and we assign a double role to these structures. The role, of course, of what they are built for to support a building, to support an excavation, but together with that to satisfy heating and cooling needs of a building. So we give a double role to such kind of, uh, of structures. As it's written here, it's a relatively new technology in the sense that it's not so new because now it's uh, many years that people are trying to do things like this. However, it's not uh, that much uh, uh, out in the field. I mean, the, the, the applications that you find are, um, yeah, you can count them, but they're not 
not not not even as much as we have in uh, in, in in shallow geothermal energy let's say uh, <clears throat> so piles piles of a building can be thermally activated these are the ones that started in the 80s and we have more applications on with respect to other energy geostructures diaphragm walls and tunnel linings so all kind of structures that interact with the ground can be in principle thermally activated to save a little bit of drilling cost that's the, the main idea we're gonna, we're gonna talk about tunnel linings because this is the topic i deal with and i also deal with this because um, if you compare i mean a building foundation to a tunnel then it's easy to say that a tunnel will uh, involve a larger volume of ground because you have the tunnel maybe if it's a metro tunnel for example goes below a city for many kilometers not only below one single building okay so there's a larger volume and that in some somehow we can think there's a big potential for for heat exchange there are a number of, um, of papers of experiences done in this in this uh, framework somebody um, to develop ways of uh, thermally activating uh, tunnels excavated with conventional methods, other with uh, segments. We've been working with uh, uh, segments, uh, tunneling, TBM tunneling, and we're going to see some examples later. This is a chart. It looks like the ones that um, Gregor showed at the very beginning, uh, but it's just related to energy geostructures. And you can see here that we had a sort of, um, in, well, the, the numbers are, are quite limited, okay, quite small. The, 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 the impact of this with respect to, to renewable energy and even with, with respect to shallow geothermal energy is, is relatively small. However, we had a quite a good increase in the early 2000 and then this is a bit not increasing that much for a number of reasons. Probably one reason is also that we don't have that much information so probably when we collected these data we we lost a few of these data which are the more, more recent one of course but there are some installations many countries have already worked in this area in great britain the switzerland austria of course and, and others okay i'm going to show you uh, our uh, our experience in, in in torino in the city we, we work northwest of, uh, of Italy and briefly I want to introduce this experimental site. Uh, we, we, we thermally activated a short section of the tunnel lining in the metro line one of our city. So basically uh, the work started in let's say 2014-2016 when we developed a patent of an energy uh, energy segment we said that energy segment segments are those concrete elements that you see in this picture that are used to i don't know how familiar you are with the technology uh, construction technology of tunnels but we use those to to build the lining of a tunnel which is the, the element that supports the excavation in in such a situation in tbm tunneling the lining that you install when you excavate is also the final lining so you directly build your tunnel as it will be when it's finished and we, we worked on thermally activating these elements so that when we install them on site they are already prepared and we had the, the chance to do a sort of proof of concept uh, kind of project and to do a real scale implementation of this and to test the, the, the behavior the performance of this system for a period of around one year this is a, a bird's eye view of, of, of my city. And I mean, Polytechnico is somewhere here. And the red thing that you see there is the Metro Line 1. And we work it here in the southern part of the city where there was a section, just a short section of three kilometers. You can see it here. That was under construction. So we, we had the chance to do some, some, some trials. And, and we did it down here close to this station, which is the, the final one, the Benghazi station this is the kind of, uh, of, of 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 installation that we did basically two full rings we call these rings of energy segments were installed at the site more or less in this situation connected to heat pump system and so basically we could 
do in, in relatively uh, full scale a real testing of of the system. The, what we say here is what is written there: a control room is simply a room where we had a heat pump system and a secondary circuit, and we could test uh, if we were able to heat or cool. Um, a room and an environment, an external environment, let's say. So this project uh, went was around two years long, as I, as I mentioned. I want to show you a few photos and also I'll try to see if a short video works because that's easy to, to understand what we did. Maybe I can skip directly to the video because if, if it works, it's going to be easier. This is, these are screenshots when we photographs when we were um, implementing the the, the, the segments. I wonder if you see the video. Let's speed it up a little bit. Okay, so you can see here that this is when we precast the segments. So basically, segments are precast in the factory, and what we had to do is do in the process, we had to stop the process to insert the pipes, as you can see here in this picture, and then start the process again. So basically, there is a time consuming stage here with respect to the normal process of tunnel construction. And as you can see here, we did it by hand, which is, um, which is good. A lot of people work in there. Uh, maybe this is, not maybe, this is an additional cost with respect to uh, normal operation. But of course, only 12 segments had to be prepared here. So it was an experimental site, so we, we could play around a little bit. It needs to be industrialized in, for, for, for when you, if you want to activate a kilometer of tunnel and so on. A lot of uh, uh, measurement instruments were placed. You, you saw the guy there was closing the pockets. You will see later what these pockets are in order to allow us to connect one segment to another segment in the tunnel. We need to have pockets to do the connection. This is when you put your uh, steel cage into the mold, then you cast concrete, as you can see in this picture, concrete is casted, and this is normal procedure. Maybe we went a little bit slower because it was the first time, but uh, with, with the concrete, I mean, but it's not really a big issue. So this is normal procedure, no, no, uh, no delays um, are added to the process. Once the casting is completed, then usually the that the segments rest for some time, then they are removed from the mold. We tested also that the pipes didn't get stuck in the, uh, during, uh, during, during the process, and then they were moved to the site, to the construction site. At the construction site, let me move a little bit forward. There we are, this is the construction site. These segments are stopped there, outside, then they are moved down into the tunnel and installed directly by the TBM, you see here in this picture the TBM, and the sequence when the segments are installed. You can see this, if you can see my mouse, that's the pocket I was mentioning, and you can see that the segments have a pocket on this side, a pocket on the other side, and they were uh, protected during this process because, of course, that's not, um, it's, it's not a very protected environment here. And afterwards, we were removing the protection and connecting segment so this is the way and of course sealing them so this is the way how we could make the connections between the segments and closing the whole ring then of course measuring systems was installed this is the when I, I call it the control room so this is the area of the metro station during construction of course and there we had the heat pump system and and as i said the secondary circuit and and all the the recordings of the the measuring tools and that's it so we can go ahead i think okay good so some screenshots i i i, I hope that the video was uh, was useful to understand uh, the details look this is a screenshot during operation and you can it's a thermal image and you can clearly see the area of the the two rings that were thermally activated that have a different temperature with respect to the rest of the tunnel so they, they were working there something is happening of course the quality of the picture is also influenced by the 
the, the, the quality of the thermal camera that, that we were having was not a fantastic camera just with our uh, cell phone. And here you see also it's a closer view of the two segments. The one, these two are the segments that we thermally activated and you can clearly see the pipes and the fluid that is going through the pipes entering here, going down, going all around and coming back from the top. So you see a difference in temperature from this one to that one because one is the entry and the other one is the, the exit. Anyhow, this is just for, um, for let's say, uh, a quality view of, of things. But of course, we, we, we had the measurements to be able to uh, to measure uh, the, the quantities, the temperature, input, output, and, and, and so on. And I'm not going into the details of this. This is just an example of one heating test. We did a, a round of something like uh, 20 uh, between heating and cooling tests along the year. And from the heat, these uh, tests, we could, um, let's say, evaluate the performance mm, in terms of energy efficiency how much energy we were able to exploit by such a system in this specific uh, geological and geotechnical context well the numbers we got are shown in this table here and basically just to make it simple it's uh, more or less uh, one uh, megawatt per kilometer of tunnel of course we only we didn't activate a kilometer but just two meters uh, of length mm -hmm. But if we extrapolate this to a kilometer of tunnel, it, it comes this number here, which is more or less one megawatt per kilometer. Okay, just to give a rough number. So in this geological context, um, and at the depth of this tunnel, and, and so on. Now, this was a nice uh, testing and nice experiment that was, um, well, let's say, was able to show the potential in, in, in our uh, environment of this kind of uh, technology. And, and so we, we were, um, let's say, um, we, we decided to, to go a step forward and try to investigate uh, what, could, uh, what could we do if we were able, instead of doing just two, two rings, but a full length of a metro tunnel. And it, it occurs that in the, in the city of Torino, we are now, uh, we are now designing the um, Turin Metro Line 2. And so we said, well, if we have the ability of thermally activating the tunnels of a metro line, then the metro line will go, this is a bit of, um, how can I say, a kid's kind of slide. You see the buildings there, you have the tunnel, you have the train, now the train is moving, okay? So what, what are we saying here? Well, we have a metro line below a city, and this is a sort of district heating system because it goes below buildings. You can use this in the areas where you have connections to the surface. To exp If you are able to exploit the heat from the linings of the tunnel, then you can move that heat to the buildings as we do with, uh, with um, shallow geothermal energy. Mm. So if, if, if we look at a plan view like this, if we have a metro line, that, that red line going uh, with, with some buildings around, and we have some areas along that line, some, some points, some localized points where we have a direct connection with the surface. Those are the metro stations, for example, or shafts, ventilation shafts, for example. So those are, uh, are connections that are built not for the thermal reason, but for, for, for the infrastructure, for the transportation reasons. And so we can use those connections with local distribution of heat, small district heating if you want, eh? somewhere. Maybe I'm not using the right words, but I want to I wanna share the idea here more than using proper words, okay? So that's the, that's the idea we, we, we tried to, uh, to, to, to investigate in some how. Because of course, if, if, we, if, if we are able to do this, then a metro tunnel, for example, line two of Turin Metro is 30 kilometers long. So that's really going from north to the south of the city. I have a slide here, and I'm going to show you that. Look, this is the city of Torino. This is the central part of the city. Then you have the suburbs in this area. And the, the blue, the yellow one here is the Metro Line 1, which is in operation. The blue one that you see here is the Metro Line 2, 
which is under design. And then you have an extension down here, another extension down there. And this in total makes 30 kilometers, which if we are able to exploit one megawatt more or less per kilometer means 30 megawatts, which is not too bad. Of course, they are distributed along, uh, along the whole uh, length of, of the city. So you need to find a way to, you, you cannot transport all the heat from one part to the other of the city, but you need to find a way to use the heat maybe close by. So we did this, we, we did a work with all these, with this group, which was the group responsible for the design, the preliminary design of uh, feasibility design, we say in fact, of Metro Line uh, 2, which is now completed, the design, not the tunnel. And after this project that we were able to quantify from, I mean, to predict, let's say, at, at the preliminary state, uh, the, the amount of energy that could be exploited in the different areas, we, did a, we went a little bit closer looking at this area here in the north to see what kind of application could we eventually uh, do in practice. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell you very, very briefly this, this story, and this is the kind of procedure that we, we tried to follow. So first of all, of course, we collected an, 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 a large amount of data uh, in order to be able to, to quantify the heat in the, in the ground. This was, of course, related to the investigation stage during the feasibility design. But of course, if you do a feasibility design, maybe you're not going to measure temperature everywhere. We had to do something more than what you are usually going to do in such a situation. For example, measuring uh, temperatures, thermal conductivity in, in, in different locations or, uh, along the city. Then we, did, we, we, we work it as we used to do when we, when we design a tunnel under, under, um, under a mountain. We divide it in sections which are more or less homogeneous. We, we usually do that from a geotechnical point of view. Here we did it from a geothermal point of view, if you want. And then from, for each homogeneous section, we run numerical model, numerical analysis. That were, uh, these were coupled analysis, thermohydraulic coupled analysis that were able to predict, to quantify the amount of heat that we could exchange. And of course, out of that, we could get the heat potential. And finally, we had to identify where can we use that heat? What were the possible receivers of the heat? So I'll go very briefly on the work. Of course, a lot of information. For example, this is an example here. You can see a screenshot of the central area of the city with the metro line. And in this picture, you see the groundwater flow direction with these arrows. And with the colors, you see the groundwater temperature. We have quite a um, fast moving groundwater flow in Torino. This is the river Po, so most of the groundwater is moving in that direction. So it's, if we look at this area, it's different from this area, just to make it simple. And that means that we will have a potential here, which is different from the potential that we have down here. Mm -hmm. So that's all. So that's why we wanted to get homogeneous sections. And then out of the homogeneous sections, we run numerical models. I'm not going into this detail. You see here an example of a numerical model of the circular tunnel. The tunnel in the design is not only uh, a deep tunnel with a TBM tunnel with segments, but also some sections are like this, cut and cover. So we also did models with respect to cut and cover. And at the end, we ended up with figures like this one. Here you see a section of the tunnel and these numbers show, sorry for the Italian here, these numbers show the power that you might exploit with in this specific section, in this other specific section and so on. You see these are all a little bit less than the, the number one megawatt that I said before, okay, but this is not a kilometer. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that. Anyhow, we tried to figure out section per section what was the amount of heat that one could exploit in summer and in winter. Of course, we were looking at both seasons. And the final step was that of identifying the receivers. So what can we do with that energy? So we went there and we were looking in buffer zones around the areas where we were had the, the direct connection to the surface, stations and shafts, as I said, what was there? What kind of buildings we would find on the surface? Can we connect? 
can we use the heat for those buildings? And this work took quite some time, and it was also done in, uh, in collaboration with uh, the owner of the district heating system in the city of uh, Torino. And we ended up with a sort of, cons of configuration, as you see here in the picture, where you have the metro line, and you have, a, let's say, a ring, the primary ring, which is directly connected to the existing district heating system, which, however, is a high temperature district heating, while from, 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 from uh, this kind of thermal activation, we can get low temperatures, so that's an issue. And so we, 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 we figured out that we could have a first uh, ring, a low temperature network, and that new buildings could be connected directly to this network, while existing building needed a sort of booster, something that could rise the temperature up for the existing buildings. And the connection to the district heating was, in our uh, intentions, a backup of all this system. How? So that was the kind of configuration that we uh, identified. And then we went into a specific area, I told you, the northern area, in order to try to see what is there. I'm not going into details, but just to tell you, for example, here we have a big hospital. This is a, uh, it's a big hospital in this area. So that's a good receiver because it's a public building. It's only one uh, user. You can speak with one, only with uh, one user and, and, and directly, uh, let's say, um, decide what to do. So that was a very good uh, potential. No? You can, we, we were thinking that the, the, the amount of heat that coming from this section of the metro could be directly used in the hospital. In this other part here, we identified new buildings. So new buildings could be heated with a low temperature grid, as we said. And in this area, instead, we have existing buildings. So probably it's not that, uh, it's less interesting than in the other one. However, the, 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 the potential is not so small. And so there we can have that kind of sort of mixed uh, grid, as we said before. So this, these are just, um, uh, let's say, feasibility ideas. Uh, but they give, they, they went, let's say, at the stage of saying, okay, this is something that it might be of interest so that we can, in the next uh, design stage, we can try to consider it. Uh, that's mm, most what I wanted to say. This is just a short uh, uh, summary of it. And uh, uh, as, as I tried to say, uh, as far as we, 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 as far as what we studied or what we tested in uh, in the field, uh, panels can, can have a good geothermal potential. Mm? We we find out that of course it's best if you can use it in summer and winter and not only in one of the season. But this is probably uh, quite obvious. We also um, identified that as the tunnel goes through the city, maybe many kilometers, as we said, uh, Joao Figueira earlier mentioned rational planning and of course it, this is this is an issue where rational planning optimization of of um, of the usage of the of the sub, subsoil temperature is need, needs uh, it's it's directly connected to to what we saw here the figure one megawatt per kilometer is more or less the number we got in, in, in our city this is not a general number of course and uh, as you know much better than me it will depend on many many issues so it's a very i think it's a good opportunity it's a nice opportunity and i said here the challenge is to really to do it in practice we've been working with uh, metro torino and we had a number of a couple of other co cooperations in, in europe all at the feasibility stage i'm really looking forward to see if we can do it in practice if we can go till the end of the different design steps. Mm. So that's it. Thank you very much for the for your uh, listening. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Marco. Very, very interesting presentation. I saw there were a lot of questions. Uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, uh, 10 minutes behind schedule. Uh, my question to Vasiliga, is there one quick question we can uh, ask, or are there too many? <laughs> There are a few comments and questions. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a very short, probably, uh, question. Uh, did you lose any pipelines during the construction process? 
Did you use any items? Lose. 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 Uh, did you lose any pipelines? Uh, ah, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, not at all. No, oh, sorry. I, I didn't <laughs> understand. No, no not at all. Uh, uh, I saw you saw in the short video that we tested it because we were worried about that. We said that's mm -hmm. the first time we're doing it. We, when we when we cast the concrete, we're going to lose everything. No, not mm, we didn't lose any. Mm. Not even. So it's one. quite robust. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, but you know uh, the the pipes that you saw, the red ones are, are the. Mm, the normal pipe that you, we you, do, we all use in, uh, in shallow geothermal energy in, in heating systems, and uh, and the concrete that you cast is normal. Con there's, there's nothing really new, and and you also mm -hmm. have a steel cage which which uh, is a protection if you want. Mm -hmm. So we had no problem. We experienced mm -hmm. no problems with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, there are further questions. I know, for instance, uh, Burkhardt was asking about the patent, because uh, mm, uh, yes. similar patents. Uh, maybe if you could answer, it would be great if you could answer these other questions in the chat room. So okay. we can move. I don't see the chat now, but as soon as I close oh, no, the, the video, I'm going to Exactly, I'm exactly. I, I will share my screen now and just to okay. introduce to our uh, next speaker. So uh, we are still. still Staying at the very shallow subsurface, to my understanding, also to constructural elements, and I'm very happy to invite uh, Søren uh, Poulsen now to speak about the uh, Danish ca case studies and microgrids, and I would uh, ask you to share your screen. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation, Gregor, to this uh, webinar. And uh, I think it's interesting to follow Marco's presentation because I'll also talk about uh, geostructures. So I'm interested in, in grids. I'm interested in, in collective heating and cooling rather than individual systems. And uh, that's mainly because it's a Danish tradition. And, and that's where we are at the moment with uh, the research and and also this market that seems to be emerging in uh, in Denmark. So I'll try to provide sort of a, a quick summary of of the status of these fifth generation district heating and cooling microgrids that we have in Denmark that we refer to as uh, thermonets. And uh, this term was coined by Søren Skjold Andersen, who's also uh, an author of this uh, presentation from Geodrilling, who established uh, all of the current operational grids and, and also the future ones that uh, are coming. So what is fifth generation district heating and cooling? Um, it's a grid that's sort of similar to traditional uh, district uh, heating grids, uh, except it runs at ambient fluid temperatures. It uses uninsulated pipes. Uh, so it has zero uh, transmission loss so we have uh, connected um, consumers or prosumers, as they are often refer to, because consumers can also produce energy. And because of the low temperatures, we can include many different uh, sources of energy uh, into this system. Uh, and because the ground is cold and we have these low fluid temperatures, uh, we can do free cooling um, with, the, with the grid. And we can use the ground for storing uh, uh, heat that uh, is in excess. This could be uh, waste heat or heat from solar panels and, and so on, industrial or process heat, uh, but also fluctuating renewables. So we should be able to, with these grids, to achieve 70, at least 70% geothermal energy for heating and, and cooling, obviously higher because we're doing it uh, without the use of a heat pump. And so we have distributed heat pumps at the consumers. So there's a definition by uh, Buffa et al, uh, who, who defines uh, 5G. <clears throat> and he identifies 40 grids across Europe. And this idea of 5G has uh, seems to have been invented multiple times, sort of independently, in different locations. There's uh, Eon, uh, Eon's Ecto grid, for instance, uh, in Sweden. Uh, there's new microgrids in the, in the US, and, and there's uh, Thermonet in, in Denmark. So so different names for, for the same thing. So why is 5G relevant in Denmark? Um, two thirds of heat consumers in Denmark has uh, traditional district heating, third generation, 
but there's one third who who doesn't have access to this uh, district heating grid because financially and economically it doesn't make sense to to provide 3g in these uh, rural areas so you see the map to the left you see the yellow no sorry the purple areas uh, centered around the large cities that's where we have the traditional district heating that's where it makes sense so the rest of Denmark, uh, we need other uh, concepts to, to supply and to ensure the, the transition into renewables. Um, there seems to be no strategic higher level planning of the transition to renewables outside the areas with traditional district heating. That's not very Danish at all, but that's how it is. So therefore the green transition is, is moving very slowly uh, in, this, in these areas. Um, as many other European countries, we, uh, we have a problem with biomass. Uh, we use too much of it. In fact, uh, per capita, we use three times more than what is sustainable. Uh, biomass is subsidized in Denmark, which is also a problem because it, that disfavors truly renewable energy sources such as uh, um, geothermal energy. And uh, we import a lot of our biomass. I think that's also a problem when we can produce it locally with uh, geothermal systems. So to sum things up, we need affordable and clean concepts that are not based on direct use of biomass for collective heating and cooling supply, first and foremost outside uh, 3G areas. Um, so to move a bit further, um, 5G is also relevant because if we look at the production mix of, of energy in, in 2030, we'll, we can see here that uh, heat pumps uh, dominate according to this prognosis by the Danish Energy Board. Um, if we look at the cooling demand in Denmark, it's quite substantial. Actually, it uh, corresponds to the heating demand in, in more than half a million family houses. And roughly half of it is, is comfort cooling. And that is something we can cover with uh, 5G. Uh, we can't do that with uh, traditional district heating uh, grids. There are some societal and consumer economic benefits from rolling out district cooling in Denmark. And if we look at the whole world, the cooling demand is, is growing uh, rapidly. Uh, and some of it is, is due to, to global warming. And that's just to underline that uh, it's not only in Denmark that we have a market for, for 5G, it's also uh, obviously in Europe and, and the rest of the world. So um, now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the grids we have in Denmark, those that are operational and those that are, are under construction or, or, or being planned. So we have seven operational uh, 5G grids in, in Denmark. So we refer to those as uh, thermonets. Uh, and we have four thermonets under construction. And they are all, uh, or they are distributed all over Denmark in in this in these areas where where we cannot get traditional uh, district heating. So I'm just going to mention a few examples. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just some illustrative examples that show different business models, different sources, uh, and so on. Uh, so one sort of general comment is that these grids are commercial. That means the compilation of operational data is, is very sparse. Um, the best example we have is uh, this grid in Silkeborg uh, that was established in, in uh, relation to a research project. So therefore, the, some operational data has been compiled from, from this grid. Uh, it supplies uh, 15 houses, uh, each with a six kilowatt heat pump. Uh, it utilizes, utilizes six bowl heat exchangers, 120 meters long. Uh, it supplies heating, uh, but no cooling. Cooling was considered, but uh, it wasn't implemented. Uh, and that's sort of uh, illustrative of, of the awareness in Denmark of, of the possibilities of cooling. Um, it's something we don't talk about it and, and no one really cares about it, even though we have a quite substantial cooling need. So in this case, the business model is that the local district heating company owns both the grid and the heat pumps, and they sell uh, heat to the consumers at uh, the standard DH price or fee. So some of the practical issues that were uh, encountered with establishing this grid is the typical problem with ground source heat pump systems, and that is trapped air. 
uh, and it can be vented, but it, it, it can take some time and, and it can cause problems in the initial part of the uh, operational period. So in the lower left figure, you see the, the topology. So you have the drillings. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. You probably can. Can you see my mouse? Yes, yes, we can okay. see the mouse. Okay, the drillings are here, six drillings. And then we have the forward and, and return pipes here. And the small uh, blue ones here are, are the pipes to the to the consumers, to the heat pumps at the consumers. So because it was a research project, um, there is some information about the COP. There was some additional instrumentation that was uh, that was employed, and the average COP is is around three point four. So I guess it's what is what can be expected from a system that that doesn't utilize cooling. So cooling will have the effect of raising the COP somewhat. If we look at the um, consumer economy. Then um, compared to traditional district heating, it's a little more expensive uh, in user costs per year. Um, but it's not that more expensive and it, it's still cheaper than, than people buying individual solutions for their, for their houses. So this is really a worst case scenario because we use BHEs exclusively. They are expensive, as someone mentioned earlier. Um, and we don't employ cooling either. We could sell that to the consumer and make the business case better. And still, it's close, pretty close to, to a traditional district heating in terms of user costs. OK, let's move on. So um, I uh, just go back. So we have the, a planned grid here in, in Tuna. It's on its way. It's not been put into operation yet. Um, and it's, it's a bigger grid. It uh, supplies 51 houses, 50, uh, 25 terraced and 26 detached houses. So the terraced houses have uh, uh, smaller, smaller heat pumps, 3 kilowatts, and, and the detached houses have uh, 6 kilowatt heat pumps. Once again, cooling was not considered. Um, and this grid has six BHEs that are 200 meters long. Uh, how this number and the length and so on was was determined, I'm not sure of. Uh, it's probably rules of thumb. I the only thing I know is we don't have any uh, design models uh, for this currently. So the grid itself consists of 3.6 kilometers of uh, uninsulated uh, forward and return piping uh, in different diameters, uh, obviously. Um, different business model here, heat pumps were purchased uh, and maintained by house owners, so it's their own responsibility. And a local energy community was formed uh, for the grid uh, that, that owns the grid. Uh, practical issues, once again, uh, trapped air. Um, it was also considered whether to fully distribute heat pumps or only do it partially. So one heat pump could supply, for instance, uh, three um, terraced houses, um, but this idea was abandoned because of the complexity that it uh, in, introduces into the topology. So, um, some the reason why they don't have cooling here is that the heat pump supplier for the developer doesn't have it in its product portfolio. So, therefore, it wasn't chosen, even though it's it's a, a fully valid option for for this uh, grid. So, again, this this lack of awareness uh, causes these sort of silly um, decisions that are made uh, reflecting sort of the awareness of the technology and what it is capable of. Okay, so now we move on to the last example here in values also on, on sealant. So um, this system is, is a little bit different uh, because it uses a, a different source. So up until now, BHEs for all of them uh, uh, but here, the grid uses a single remediation well. So remediation well is, is somehow keeping a, a groundwater contamination uh, in place. And so it, it's running 24-7, and it has a yield in this particular case of 28 to 30 cubic meters per hour. So the idea was here, well, we might as well take the energy out of this uh, water that's being pumped anyway. So it supplies uh, 32 houses in total. One being this uh, communal house that is shown here, and the rest are single family houses. 
six kilowatt heat pumps again. Once again, no cooling. It wasn't considered. Um, and the heat pumps were purchased by house owners again. Also, they are also responsible for maintaining them and, and providing service. Uh, and the grid is financed by, by taking mortgage in houses. So I guess it's also purchased by house owners. Uh, practical issues encountered in, in the uh, construction. Uh, there was unstable operation in, in the first period due to erroneous installation of heat pumps. There were also noise from these heat pumps and apparently there was also leakage from the grid. So once again, there are all these sort of practical issues that we, we also need to, to uh, know something about when we construct these grids. So to sum up things, I have this silly, silly window that I have to move around. Um, so to sum up this uh, knowledge gap, uh, and the focus in, in our research and development projects that sort of reflect this knowledge gap is that we, uh, we lack energy and design models for sizing and estimating capital and operational costs. So we need to be able to size grids. That's the way to minimize capital costs uh, while not compromising capacity. And if we can simulate the system and, and temperatures uh, of the fluid, we can also estimate the operational costs. So that's uh, an approach to, to making a business case. We need best practice that describe all project phases. We need a cookbook for other people to use to, to, uh, to make grips like this. We need viable uh, and optimal business models. So we need to know which business model to use uh, here in Denmark, given the conditions uh, in our country. Uh, so so which, op which business model is optimal? That is yet to be found out. Um, also, as you can see from the examples, practical experience and know-how, that's also required. Uh, and we need to explore grid source concepts that has lower capital costs, because uh, what we do know is that uh, capital costs uh, take up a lot of attention in, in these grids. They are more expensive, and we need ways to reduce those costs. So. Given Marco's talk on, on uh, due structures, uh, this is a, an interesting approach, where a path that we have also taken in, in our research projects. So to pick a geothermal heat exchanger, so if we have to consider economy, then due structures such as energy piles are very interesting because they are cost effective. So one meter of energy pile is, is quite cheap compared to a, a bowl heat exchanger. So we have done a, a line of research projects with uh, energy piles, starting back in 15 with a, an industrial PhD project with uh, Maria, shown here in the picture from Spain. Uh, she did a project titled Design and Performance of Energy Pile Foundations. And Maria started out uh, at a quite low TIL level. So the energy piles produced in Denmark by this company, Central Pele, uh, they didn't know anything about the thermal performance of the pile. Uh, so we, we started out um, at around TL3. Uh, and Maria, um, Maria did a lot of field work testing uh, energy piles with our thermal response test equipment at VIA. Um, and then she tried to model uh, that thermal behavior that she was measuring in the real world uh, with uh, finite element modeling. And she was able to develop these uh, G functions for energy piles that are dimensionless temperature functions um, that we use to describe um, the thermal behavior of the pile. So she was able to validate her models to her experimental data and finally top off her work with a dimensioning tool that she provided for the company that for a given project and a, a given plan for the piles as uh, shown in this example here for the for Rosborg Gymnasium uh, in, in Weile in Jutland, it can tell you how many piles you need to support a, a certain demand profile from the building and which piles to pick as energy piles because that's not uh, trivial because if you place them too close to each other, they tend to cannibalize on, on the same energy. So this example that is shown here is actually from uh, the 
gymnasium, this building that is shown here, this is an actual building. It was built in 2011, uh, this particular building here. And so when we use the tool on, on this particular building, we can see that not all piles are picked as energy piles. Um, the building actually has all piles as energy piles, so it, it's able to produce energy. So if it had some other buildings connected to it, it would be able to supply both heating and, and cooling. So that gave us the idea to uh, continue this line of research um, and implement or think of these energy piles as something that is uh, the main energy source for a fifth generation district heating and cooling grid. So we applied for this uh, project, Sustainable Building Integrated Heating and Cooling for Future Resilient Cities. We continued in the same area uh, in Weile, in Jutland. Uh, we moved a little bit west um, to this area here. This is a new area that is currently under development. It, it hasn't been built yet. And uh, But we know the plans and what it's going to look like. It's going to be something like this. It's sort of built on small islands. Islands, um, And we wanted to see uh, what if we uh, put together a 5G grid uh, in this area here, Rosborg, um, and try to, try to do the business case on it by comparing it to traditional district heating. So first we did a geothermal screening. So we screen, we did a geological model uh, complemented by geophysical uh, investigations. We took soil samples, measured soil thermal conductivity, volumetric heat capacity with a hot disk. We were able to, to do these contour maps of, of these two thermal properties. So that allows, that serves as input for um, a computational temperature model that we developed for piles with horizontal piping, where the horizontal piping can also exchange energy with the soil. So to do that, we need to compute flow on the grid. Um, so we do this Darcy Weisbach pipe flow model. Uh, a pipe heat transport model is a Laplace transform uh, model that works extremely well for, for these horizontal geothermal pipes. And then Maria's uh, G functions from her PhD study. So that allows us to compute temperatures uh, for this grid. And we studied two typologies of buildings. One is office, the other is residential. And that's because they sort of they differ quite a lot in, in the demand profile. So we found that energy piles, if fully employed, can support three floors on average with a return of investment of uh, 3.8 years. And in the residential case, we can supply a little bit more, uh, four floors and return of investment is 6.3 years. So the main reason for these differences is that we have peak loads in, uh, for the office in the office case in terms of both heating and cooling. And uh, we have a lower limit on temperatures, the geotechnical limit of two degrees. So we, we are not sure about geotechnical stability once we go below these uh, fluid temperatures. So we, we can't accept that. Um, so I think this is a very interesting result because it shows that once we utilize infrastructure that is being put in the ground anyway, then we can s really significantly reduce the return of investment period. So I like this way of thinking, using existing infrastructure in the ground. So what other infrastructure can we think of besides uh, Marco's tunnels? So every time we, uh, we have to do a new residential area, we have to build roads. And when we build a road, we put the pavement on top of a, a new technical structure that we call a roadbed. And the roadbed ensures that the pavement stays in place when a truck drives over it. Uh, so we have, to, we have to excavate to establish this uh, roadbed. So uh, we have another project where we um, embed geothermal piping into this roadbed. So we're digging this hole anyway, so we might as well put some geothermal piping in it. We are also digging a ditch for the uh, wastewater pipe that carries sort of uh, lukewarm water. Uh, from showering and so on. So we are digging that ditch anyway, so we might as well put a heat exchanger in uh, anyway. So to supply both heating and cooling, uh, we have to be able to also 
uh, provide cooling uh, with certainty. And we cannot do that with heat exchangers in the roadbed because the road will get hot or the roadbed will get hot in the summer as well. So we can't be absolutely sure that we can provide cooling. And we certainly can't with, uh, with this one down here because it'll always be sort of uh, warm to some extent. So we need a few BHEs, but the primary thermal load in a heating dominant country like Denmark can be taken by the piping in the roadbed. That's the whole idea. That's to bring down um, capital costs because BHEs are expensive and it's pretty cheap to put in these uh, pipes in, into the road. So just to uh, sum this up, so we use existing subsurface infrastructure to remediate symptoms. Um, oh yeah, actually I forgot to mention it. We, we solved two problems with, with this technology. So you can see on this drawing here that it, it, it actually rains here. So we don't only use the roadbed as a, a source for our 5G grid. We also use it to retain uh, surface water. So it's hydraulically disconnected from the surroundings by bentonite mats. And then we drain water from the surface into the roadbed. And then we have a water break up here that uh, ensures that water slowly trickles to the um, rainwater sewage out here, uh, no matter how much water there is in, in the roadbed. So it's, it's a system that also handles uh, excess rainwater, which is or excess surface water, which is a, a, an increasing problem in Denmark and, and I guess all over the world. So this is a symptom of climate change. Uh, the cause of climate change is addressed with the 5G grid. Uh, we also reduce capital costs with this system and the area use. So if we had to take care of this rainwater uh, on the surface, we would have to dig out a rainwater basin. Then we cannot sell that a uh, lot and we can't uh, build a house on it with uh, taxpayers in it. So, um, so it's beneficial to, to get rid of stuff and, and put it below the, the ground surface. So we've actually demonstrated this concept in, in full scale, um, or we're doing it as we speak. And I want to show you some pictures uh, as the final part of the presentation. So uh, this is the heat exchanger in the, in the ditch for the, um, for the wastewater pipe. So that was the first thing to be, to be put in. So these are the main tra transmission pipes, forward and, and return manifolds. These are the pipes to the consumers, uh, to this side of the road and to the other side of the road. And um, here we have the water break is inside this manhole. So it controls the outflow of water from, from the roadbed to the rainwater sewage. So here you see the bentonite mats. This is our way of hydraulically separating it, uh, the, the roadbed from the surroundings. So we don't just create a big drain in the area. So, uh, imagine we had a high water level here, a groundwater level, then we would simply be draining the entire area. So we need to disconnect it from its surroundings to use it as a, as a bathtub that we have uh, full control over. So here you see the roadbed with the geothermal piping. So we have the geothermal piping here in, in, the, in the bottom. Then we have this soft gravel to protect the pipes. And then we have the coarse gravel on top. And the porosity is around 30%. And uh, this roadbed here can take a 100-year event in terms of precipitation. And this pre precipitation will tickle down, uh, trickle down on, on, to on, on these geothermal pipes. And, and this helps the ground source heat pump system uh, because we're sort of constantly removing the cold from, from the pipes. So this is more or less the current state. So this is all, all the different sources that are coming into this large two and a half meter diameter concrete well or manhole. Um, and we need to put all this uh, spaghetti together um, but as you can see, there's pavement on now and, and we are uh, almost done with uh, the construction. So the next interesting thing in this research project is to, to see if we can sell the lots out here and, and we get some houses and some con consumers to get thermal loads on the system. So just to conclude, the seven operational uh, 5G grids in Denmark demonstrate their viability. However, there's still a substantial lack of proper design guidelines 
practical know-how and operational experience. So our current re research and development projects focus on developing design tools and energy models, a best practice that fully describes all the project phases from decision to end of life. And, and we also need some tools for, for doing the life cycle analysis uh, on these grids. We need viable and, and optimal business models. We need new concepts with lower capital costs, such as the Thermal Road, for instance. Uh, we need full-scale demonstration to cover entire knowledge gap because there's so much practical stuff that uh, we need to get better at with this. And there's only one way to learn it. It is to get off your desk and, and go out and, and build these things. And also we need international collaborations to reach uh, critical mass in terms of knowledge uh, so that we can make the final push towards uh, market adoption, the market adoption tipping point, which I think we're not so far from, at least in Denmark. So finally, just to raise your attention to a new project that we uh, just got before uh, Christmas, this cool geo heat project that uh, investigates a lot of these or addresses a lot of these uh, issues that I have raised uh, in, uh, with respect to 5G grids. So uh, the title is Shallow Geothermal Energy, the Green and Effective Heating and Cooling Grids of, of the Future. So that's all I had. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Søren. Very interesting presentation, well fitting to the talk of, of Marco before. Uh, and I think it's a very promising uh, uh, technology. And um, um, <clears throat> I mean, these kind of grids are spreading all over Europe now uh, and still face a lot of, uh, let's say, objective, objections. Uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to this low temperature heating cooling grids. So we are already at uh, T uh, 10 minutes behind schedule. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. Um, is there any question from the chat, Vasiliki? One quick question. Yes, uh, there is a question uh, in the chat room. Uh, uh, so, uh, what would be the minimum size of uh, thermonet grids in terms of capacities and buildings to justify investment costs and make us uh, uh, and uh, make use of economic uh, scaling effects? Well, the economy of scales is, is quite different. So the smallest thermonet we have in Denmark, I think it's uh, three houses. Um, uh, but uh, there is obviously, there is some economy of scales, but uh, it's it's not at all similar to, to traditional district heating. This is something that we will address in, in our projects uh, to get an idea of the economical profile for, uh, for these grids. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a definitive answer, mm -hmm. but it's okay. obvious that we need to reduce capital costs in, in some way to be smart about our heat exchanges in the ground. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Søren. And we now come to our last presentation of today. And so we will move now to the uh, further very promising future topic, uh, uh, energy storage or underground thermal energy sto storage. And I'm happy to, uh, have um, Stein here uh, to give his presentation about uh, monitoring of aquifer thermal energy storage systems at the Koppert Crest case study in the Netherlands. So the floor is yours and uh, please share your screen. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everything works. I do, are you already speaking? I cannot hear you. There is some problem with a microphone, I assume. Can you try to connect maybe your microphone as well? Uh, uh, once again, I see you, but I cannot hear you. No. Um, Maybe just connect and disconnect again your headset. Huh? No, I'm sorry. sorry. Ah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now it works. Perfect. Really? <laughs> okay, awesome. I'll take off my headset. Mm -hmm. um, sorry for the delay. Um, So. 
Okay, you see my screen still, right? Yes, now I see your presentation. Great, perfect. Now you see it, I hope. Yes, yeah, so you can hear and see me? Yes, we... perfectly. All right, perfect, thanks. <laughs> um, yes, well, thanks, uh, Gregor. Uh, my name is uh, Stan Beerling. Um, I'm a researcher in geohydrology at uh, KWR, which is a water research institute in the Netherlands. And I'm also a PhD researcher at the TU Delft uh, since uh, last October. So I just uh, started with my PhD and it's on uh, high temperature ATS. Um, and so that's also why I want to tell you something about uh, the monitoring we do at the uh, high temperature aquifer thermal energy storage system of Corporate Press. Uh, in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, we have been looking at the system and uh, monitoring it for the last five years. And also, um, since a few years, it's a part of the HeStore project. This is a big uh, European uh, project on high temperature heat storage. Um, as you can see, there are some uh, demonstration sites uh, in that project. And one of the case studies uh, of that research is the Coppercrest case. So it's in the western part of the Netherlands, as you see here. And when we zoom into that a bit more, we see that uh, Coppet Cress um, is located in, in the middle of a big uh, horticultural area in the Netherlands. It's called the Westland. And uh, Coppet Cress itself is also a big uh, horticultural company. Um, and what they do is uh, they make a uh, cress. So I think in, in English it's also called uh, garden cress. So um, it's a sort of plant uh, which is used in fancy uh, restaurants. Um, and these plants are uh, grown inside these large uh, greenhouses, as you can see here, actually. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, as you can see on the right. And um, yeah, so these greenhouses uh, need a lot of heat most of the year, but also need uh, a bit of cooling in summer. And therefore, uh, the system has a uh, ATES system, so aquifer thermal energy storage system. I think most of you uh, know how this uh, system works, but very shortly. Um, so a ATES system has both a warm and a cold well. Uh, in summer, there's a cooling demand, so cold water from the cold well is extracted. Um, the building is cooled and the warm water is uh, stored in the warm well. Um, and this warm water is again used in winter when there is a heating demand to heat the building. And then this cool down water is again stored in the cold well, etc. So I think this is pretty basic. Um, and ATES is in the Netherlands a really proven uh, technology about uh, 2,500 to 3,000 systems are operational there already. But uh, the system I'm going to talk about uh, today is uh, special from these normal systems because, um, as I think Joao also told you, uh, the normal maximum temperature is um, about 25 degrees Celsius in the Netherlands. And for this uh, case study, we, we can inject higher temperatures. Um, so that's why uh, this is a, a high temperature ATES pilot. And uh, for this case study, we are able uh, to uh, inject up to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, as you now can also see in the picture. Um, and therefore we are um, monitoring this system. And our goal is to monitoring both the performance. So uh, what is the uh, impact of the higher uh, storage temperature on the, uh, on the performance of the entire heating and cooling system? Um, but also what the impact is of this higher temperature on the uh, subsurface and the water quality. Um, so yeah, here's an overview of uh, the uh, ATES system of Corporate Press. So in the middle, you see the uh, large greenhouse of Corporate Press, um, and on the northern side, the four warm wells, and on the southern side, the four cold wells. And they are located about uh, 200 meters uh, 200 meters apart from each other. Um, and if we then look at the subsurface, so at these wells, 
we see that um, all wells, so all eight wells, have two screens. So they extract and, and inject water from a shallow screen and a deep screen uh, located in two different aquifers. So we have a shallow aquifer uh, located between minus 50 and minus 75 meters depth and a deeper aquifer located between minus 130 and uh, 150 meters depth. So uh, water is extracted from both aquifers mixed and then injected on the other side um, again in those two aquifers. Um, yeah, so before we are going to look at the results um, of the monitoring, I first want to uh, tell you something about um, how the heating and cooling system of uh, Coppercrest works, because then it's more easy to, um, to interpret uh, the results of the monitoring. Um, so yeah, um, the ATA system of Coppercrest was not always a high temperature ATA system. Uh, the system started in uh, 2012 as a normal ATA system um, and they found um, that the heating demand of the system is way larger than the cooling demand. So there was a big um, imbalance um, in the ATA system and uh, they wanted to do something about that um, and therefore they applied for uh, this higher storage uh, temperature which um, yeah, which made it possible to store more heat with the same amount of uh, volume. Um, yeah, so they wanted to add more heat in the warm wells. So this is how the system uh, looked uh, from the start. So like a normal uh, ATA system, you have the cold well, the warm well, and in the middle, the heat pump. Um, and uh, after 2015, Coppercrest started adding more and more uh, sources of heat to this uh, system. And currently, uh, four sources of heat are added. So there is a pond um, of which they extract heat. Um, there is a big uh, cold storage, so like a refrigerator um, of which they take the uh, excess heat. Uh, they have a lot of uh, solar arrays on top. Um, of the greenhouses, and they also use um, excess heat of the combined heat and power plant. Um, altogether, uh, this adds up to about uh, eight and a half uh, terajoule each year of extra heat. So this is really good, and also some of this heat is um, of higher temperature. However, um, the sources are mostly passive, which means that um, they can only be uh, used and they only add heat to the system um, when this heat is available. For instance, looking at the solar array, this only gives heat to the system when there's sun, etc. Um, so therefore, um, it is not always the case that this high temperature, this 40 uh, degrees Celsius is uh, injected in the warm wells, but this only happens sometimes. We can see in this picture. So here we see the temperature of the warm wells. Um, so the average temperature of the four warm wells of the system uh, from 2011 to 2020. Um, the orange lines is the hourly averaged um, temperature and the red lines uh, is the daily averaged uh, temperature. Um, and as we can see that um, after the uh, transition year, so 2015, the uh, system started uh, to add more high temperature heat and the temperature of the wells um, increased slowly. Um, and yeah, as we can see, uh, the average temperature increased clearly after 2015, um, but on average, um, the storage temperature is about 22, maybe 22 degrees uh, Celsius. So not nearly near the uh, 40 degrees Celsius. But on the hottest days of the year, as you can see, for instance, in the summer of 2018 and 2019, um, this real high temperature heat can be stored in the warm weather. So this, um, in, so the improvement of the warm well temperature um, led to a 
bigger delta t as, as we call it so the average um temperature difference between the warm wells and the cold wells and this is a good indicator for the amount of energy that you can uh, transport per amount of volume and this also means that uh, less water uh, needs to be used for the same amount of energy as we can see here so the delta t increased from five to about 12 so it's more than doubled uh, between 2012 and 2019 um, and therefore also the volume that was used for heating decreased from about 700,000 to about 400,000. Well, actually the heat that was um, transported from the hot wells was actually increased. So this delta T really helped to uh, get a better system because um, this Im imbalance was mostly due to the very large volume that was used uh, for heating um, and if we compare this volume that is used for heating to the volume that is used for cooling uh, so that is the uh, orange line in the bottom we see that um, the difference between the amount of volume that is used for heating and for cooling uh, decreased which is good but still um, there's a large difference uh, between these two flows um, so the imbalance uh, decreased, but it is still there. And yeah, we can clearly see that also in this picture, which is a simulation, which we did with all the data of the copter system. And so the left figures uh, show the situation at the end of the winter in 2020. So after eight years of operation, and on the right side you see the end of summer. And what is clear here is that um, the thermal radius, so the warm bubble around the warm wells, is um, each year about max 20 meters. So it grows during summer and then shrinks very quickly uh, when winter is there. While the uh, volume that is stored in the cold wells um, increases and increases each year. So now after eight years, uh, there's like this big cold bubble in the subsurface um, that has a thermal radius of more than 120 meters. Um, yes, so now let's look at the monitoring system. Um, the monitoring system is uh, situated around the warm wells, of course, and is mainly um, located near warm well one. So um, we can see on the figure um, to the north side of 111 four yellow uh, shapes. And uh, those shapes are the locations where we have DTS monitoring. DTS is a distributed temperature sensing and it uh, uses um, uh, fiber optics to measure the uh, temperature. Um, along a cable um, for each millimeter at a very um, high accuracy. So we have this uh, cable in the ground at four locations. And then also we have these three uh, monitoring wells, which you can see with the stars. So we have PB1, PB2, and PB3. Uh, PB3 is most uh, closely uh, to 101. And uh, those are used um, mainly to take uh, groundwater samples to analyze for changes. All right, now let's take a look at the DTS uh, location. So here in the middle of this figure, you see uh, 101. And then to the north side, as, we, uh, as I showed you, we have a line of four DTS. Um, and of these two, uh, of these four DTS locations, two are shallow. So, so two cables only measure the uh, shallow screen of the system. And the two in the middle measure also the deep screen. So the shallow aquifer is um, monitored with four DTS uh, locations and the deeper aquifer is measured with two DTS locations. And now uh, go Let's go to the results of this monitoring. So we have been uh, monitoring this for like three years. 
Um, and here I show you the results of uh, 2020 and um, how to interpret this uh, figure is um, well each color you see is a moment in time um, so from this picture we can very easily see the maximum temperatures and the minimum temperatures um, along the depth of the dts and what is very obvious and also very logical is that um, this maximum temperature decreases going further away from the warm well. Um, but what is um, not so obvious is the large difference between the, um, the temperature increase we see uh, between the shallow aquifer and the deep aquifer. So uh, the temperature increase is way larger in the shallow aquifer. And why this is the case is probably because uh, more water is also stored in, in this aquifer. Um, what else can we see from this picture? Well, if we, for instance, zoom in on the aquifer part, we can see that um, the DTS cables very clearly um, monitor where uh, um, more permeable layers are um, in the aquifer. So you can see the heterogeneity of the aquifer. And then something which is a bit odd is this, um, yeah, is this higher temperature in the middle of the equitar. And um, we think uh, this is the case because um, also the warm well itself um, loses heat to the uh, subsurface. And um, we think that at that location, there is a little sand layer that, uh, that takes up this heat and can transport it to the near uh, subsurface. Therefore, we can also measure that there. All right. Um, now to look a bit more at a temporal uh, figure, we are going to look only at the shallow aquifer. So we're going to look at the four locations we measure in the shallow aquifer. Um, each uh, location has a certain color, as you can see here. Um, and then the picture looks like this. So what we see here again is that the temperature is highest at uh, the closest uh, location and at 20 meters uh, distance from the warm well, we see no heating of the, of the subsurface. And what is um, probably uh, most important that we see here is that um, every year, or at least in this year, even after eight years of use of, of the system, the, uh, the subsurface around the warm wells cools down entirely back to the uh, natural uh, ambient temperature of the, of the subsurface air, so which is about uh, 15 degrees Celsius. And this actually shows us uh, that the horizontal uh, impact here, so the long-term uh, horizontal impact is actually quite small, which is the case because we have this huge imbalance uh, between the, uh, the warm wells and cold wells. Um, so the warm well is uh, empty um, in winter each year, and therefore the long-term horizontal impact is very small. And yeah, so that is really uh, clear here. All right, um, if we then uh, zoom a bit more into the uh, vertical impact that we can see, so that is the, the, um, the conduction uh, from the stored heat in the aquifer to the uh, layers above and also below, but now we are only going to look at uh, what happened above the aquifer. Um, it is nice to look at this and have a reference uh, situation. So. To have a reference, we are going to uh, look at okay, what what would be the steady state um, temperature distribution in the subsurface um, when the storage temperature is always, uh, for instance, 25 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius. So 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 this is the maximum 
um, heating of the subservice that can happen after a long time. And by comparing this to what is the actual um, heating of the uh, subsurface up above the aquifer, um, yeah, shows us how severe the vertical impact really is. So if we are going to look at this for our case, we, uh, we here again have the four locations. So the one close to the um, aquifer, uh, to the warm well is the red line and the one furthest away from the warm well is the black line. And we see that, yes, at the end of summer, there is some heating uh, from the aquifer to the clay layer above. Um, but um, at the end of winter, this has already been cooled down again because the water in the aquifer is also cool again. So, um, yeah, if you look at the uh, figure of the end of winter, you can still see a little bit of um, heating of the of this clay layer. So there is some impact, there is some heating, which will grow and grow and grow each year. Um, but again, this uh, yeah, impact is very small. So let's go to some conclusions. Um, yeah, as I showed you, the corporate crest ATIS uh, system is uh, very imbalanced. But due to the higher uh, injection temperature, it is improving. Um, also, due to this uh, large imbalance, the thermal impact is very small, both in a horizontal way and in a vertical way. Um, and I also showed that uh, DTS monitoring is very suitable to measure uh, these temporal uh, temperature difference in the subsurface. And so we think this is very usable for future uh, high temperature ATES systems. However, did, this was not the only uh, thing we looked at uh, for this uh, case study until now. We also looked, uh, for instance, at the uh, entire uh, performance of the heating and cooling system with the higher uh, storage temperatures. And we found that um, the operational cost decrease with 10% and that the um, the greenhouse gas emissions um, decrease with even up to 30 to 70%. And we also did, as I uh, told you, uh, groundwater monitoring and we did uh, chemical and microbiological analysis um, of these samples. Um, and we found that um, most um, most effects that we found were due to the mixing of those two aquifers. So um, mm -hmm. that is also something you have to think about. Mm -hmm. So overall, I think a take home uh, message would be that uh, higher storage temperatures for your warm wells is a really nice uh, possibility um, for many buildings that now have um, only a uh, lower temperature warm well. So something about the future research uh, we will do at this case study, because the transition is not yet done. In the uh, future, we will have more heat available at the case study area um, due to probably a geothermal uh, well. Um, therefore, we can store way more heat in the warm wells um, up to the point that there is a balance. And then we can actually measure the long term heating of the subsurface uh, around the warm wells with the uh, DTS. Um, so, therefore, we are going to uh, continue this monitoring um, yeah, to be continued. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Stein, uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I saw there were a few questions in the chat. Uh, maybe we take one quick, right. and sure. and because we are already over time, but I would like to say to all audience, who, all uh, colleagues who are still here, we will also uh, collect the chat protocol uh, for the documentation. So you, 
there will be the chance to read all the questions again and get uh, the answers. So some of the questions maybe we have to ask presenters later on, but you will receive that. All right. Okay, yeah. okay Vasiliki, uh, one quick question for... Yeah. Yes. Uh, did you observe any problems with fooling at temperature levels of around 40 degrees Celsius? Sorry, I couldn't hear that very well. With fouling, uh, with bacterial growth. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, no, no, we didn't find it. And that's probably also because um, those high temperatures are only sometimes there in the mm. surface. Mm. And yeah, for instance, on a daily basis during the hottest part of the day, um, for instance, during two or three hours, we can inject mm -hmm. this very hot water, but um, in the evening, uh, we also inject water with a uh, lower temperature. This mixes in the subsurface and the temperature decreases again. Um, so, no, we didn't find that, but yeah, that's of course of uh, interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other questions are still in the chat. Um, okay. Mm, so I will just uh, close now the webinar uh, uh, on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. My thanks. Fi my final slide. So thanks all for for the presenters to contributing to this very interesting webinar. Um, thank you all for participating to it. Uh, as I mentioned before, there will be a documentation available and will be presented to you. Uh, there will be. Uh, the presentation shared uh, uh, in, in, a, in a publishable way and I would like to uh, inform you we have uh, two more webinars com coming up in the next uh, weeks. Uh, one will be about petrothermal energy research in the United States from uh, about the Utah Forge project from uh, I think a very interesting and also very, very important topic uh, as we look at uh, maybe using geothermal energy in non-basin areas for heating systems on a high temperature level. Uh, we will also, it's not a fixed date, we will have a webinar on, on the importance of life cycle analysis in geothermal heating and cooling networks. The date will be uh, confirmed soon. Uh, and yeah, and if you would like to join our network and or our newsletter, please visit our website. We are an open research network and we are we're looking for new contacts and there is a good way to exchange ideas, get new ideas. And um, as time already preceded, I, I say we will skip the group photo. Uh, and uh, I'm, thank you very much for coming and uh, stay in contact. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.